Hello, everyone. Welcome to the pre-show. We're just getting things started here. Really not just getting things started here. Things have been going here for quite some time. But as far as you're concerned, you've just arrived. And uh, in about 10 minutes, we'll get started. So if you're watching this in the replay and like, you'd like to skip ahead to when we are actually having a live event and getting started, you can do that. Or you can hang out here with me while I change my website bar at the top to let everybody know that we are beginning this event. And my Security Plus study group is right now. Exclamation mark. Click here to join us. What's an exclamation mark? Slash live. And reset the cookie so the people that hit it will be able to see it and save the changes. And that will update. Oh, I should probably. <clears throat> no, I think that should cover it. Hello, chat room. Hello, everybody. If you are watching this live, you can visit our website at professormesser.com slash live for all the details of what's going on. You can see the video there. The chat room is there for the live event chat. Hello, chat room. And I'll be referencing and talking and discussing and whatever questions you put there. I will see during this live event. If you're watching this in the replay, obviously, there's no live event. There's no interactive QA. You're just hanging out watching the video, which is fine, too. You can always follow along. If you are here live, you may want to connect to our interactive Q&A at professormesser.com slash QA. QA stands for questions, answers. <clears throat> uh, how about a check of some cameras? I need to sit up a little higher, don't I? I need a, need a phone book. I need something. Maybe if I moved a little closer. Don't be shy. Camera two, camera three. And camera, uh, let's put up a presentation so it shows camera four. Camera four is there. See, it all works. Oh, how about the uh, number there? Yeah, that works. That wasn't working quite right the other day, the other time with the stuff and the thing. It seems like I'm lower in my chair, though, than I normally am. It may be time to get a new chair, everyone. Maybe that time. Do you know that pains me to find a new chair? I like the chair I'm using, but I can't find it anymore. They are not making it. So it's something I bought, huh, bought a long time ago. So I feel like I've got my money's worth, but now you have to replace a chair? Oh, it's not so easy. I spend a lot of time in this chair. I spend a uh, very lot amount of time in this chair. I spend all day and all night in the chair. Because usually what I do, wherever this camera is that you're seeing now, this is what I call my bird cam. That bird cam is just above where my television usually sits, which is now sitting in front of me. I have it on wheels, so I wheel it around, and that's where my Xbox lives. So during the day, I'm facing this direction. During the night, facing this direction. It's a little bit different. Go to Ikea. I don't have an Ikea in my geographical area. And that's kind of the problem when buying a chair, isn't it? You, need, you really need to sit in the chair. You need to sit in the chair, especially one that I'm going to be sitting in as long as I'm going to sit in it. You know, I am lower. I can tell by the thing with the stuff. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to adjust this real quick. So you're not going to see me for a moment while I fight with this chair. Da, da, da. Ba, 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 ba. Let's see how that changes things. See how that changes things? That does change things. And I can tell it's a little bit better. It's a, it's a game of inches, people. That's how it works. Socrative is started. If you go to professormesser.com slash QA, you'll be in Socrative. It should have a question there waiting for you. Yep, first question is showing up. Very good. And now it's an easy link, professormesser.com slash QA. That link also for Socrative is on the live page, professormesser.com slash live. Oh, what else is going on here? You're right, it's not submitting. Yeah, Socrative's been having some problems. I don't think that it is. 
So Crowder ran into some issues yesterday, and it wasn't showing what was going on the screen. So we might be just presenting it to you that way, that way and we're not going to have an interactive show me how many people said what today. Yeah, it's got a, they've had, uh, they ran into some type of database issue yesterday. They maxed out their database. Where is my Twitter? Let's go to uh, me and Scrative. That's not me. That's somebody else. And click me. Let's find Socrative. Let's see what their status is. Da, da, da. Da, 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 da. It's currently not saving student responses. See, that's how it works. But it is saving them. So it just won't show it on the screen, but it's saving them, which doesn't help you at all. Because uh, usually this is designed for a classroom, and then you, er, you, the teacher can see exactly what student is answering what question. Well, I don't care. I'm just sort of getting an overview of what's going on. So they do say you should all be all set tomorrow, except we're not. So that was yesterday. It was 19 hours ago, uh, which would be yesterday, which means this is tomorrow. But tomorrow is obviously not working right, which is today. I'm glad we could all follow along. So that's too bad. Yes, it won't submit. It won't, uh, won't let you put it in the question what's the thing. But you'll be able to see it. I'll have it, of course, on my screen, too. But we'll just play along. We won't know how you did with this. So this will be fun for me because I won't have any idea how, how people did on this one. Oh, well. I think we can work around it. There's really no think about it. Hey, how about we turn off a phone? That's a great idea. How's our temperature? Oh, we haven't even looked at the birds today. I have no idea how things are going out there. What's happening with the birds? Let's see what's happening. Boy, what slow response time on my bird feeder. There's all kinds of problems today. What's going on? Why isn't it working? It's DNS. It's always DNS. Oh, that's a significant issue, isn't it? fact that it doesn't work at all. I'm guessing dun, 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 dun. it won't submit. The questions won't. Socrative won't work for you. You can you can choose your answer, so that'll be a thing. There is no login. There's nothing to log into. You just go to professormesser.com slash QA. And it should be just like that. Although we need some food, the bird feeder, don't we? It's uh, not a lot there. That'll give me something to do when we're done here today. Overcast today. You can see, oh, it even says overcast in the weather there. Oh, I don't have my, uh, my little yellow highlighter loaded. See, that's good. Oh, the birds are very loud today. Let's put up pinpoint. I don't have to. No, it doesn't work. <laughs> Everybody's showing up like, this isn't working. Yes, Socrative is not working. So for those of you that follow along that have done this before, Socrative isn't working. All right, so birdfeeder.com, birdfeeder.live is uh, where we're going. It was weird. It's a weird set of things. Popping up there. But that's okay. Because I got a lot of weird things that. Uh, that sounds good though. Audio's coming through nice. Video looks pretty good. It's about time though. About time to get started on this thing. So we'll put the birds away. I see a lot of you are in Socrative. We just can't answer. That's okay. We will figure it out. And is there somebody really at my front door right now? Let's, let's find out about that. We're going to start this in just a moment. I don't think so.
All right, it's time. We can do a thing. Let's uh, get that started. Let's prompt this, get that ready to go, and we're off. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the May 2017 Professor Messer Security Plus Study Group. There we go. Get the right camera in front of you. Hi, I'm James Messer. Welcome to the study group. We're going to go through a lot of Q&A today dealing with Security Plus. I've got plenty of questions ready to go for you. We have a few technical issues this month regarding this particular study group and answering the questions, but you will be able to see the questions. We will all uh, be able to at least know what your answer might be. And later on, you can, of course, go back and see how you did with all of these questions that we're doing. This is a study group I do every month. I'm able to do this study group because of your support. Thank you for everything that you do. A lot of you use my Security Plus study group to help with your CompTIA Security Plus studies, preparing for that exam. Of course, all of my videos are available to watch online for free. A number of you like to have an offline version as well. This is the offline version. I send it to you in a flash drive. It's also downloadable the instant you purchase it. There's HD video on here. I also add MP3 files for audio, so you don't have to have the video playing while you're in a car, for example. Also, my course notes are included with this. We'll talk about the course notes in a bit. You can find out all about this at professormesser.com slash getsec. Plus, of course, we're always doing something here regarding these certifications and what's going on. If you'd like to follow what's going on, you can always watch us, follow us, track us, uh, join what we're doing at professormesser.com slash Twitter slash YouTube. And of course, don't forget about the voucher discounts at professormesser.com slash vouchers. There is also free questions. I take the questions from these study groups and I put them online for you to to uh, absolutely free. So you can go through in a 20 question sample block of questions. You can find all of these for A plus network plus and security plus at professormesser.com slash pop quiz. And of course, don't forget that this podcast is available in audio form. Actually, it's the, the video version of this is available as a podcast in audio form at professormesser.com slash podcasts. And you'll be able to listen to, subscribe to, uh, put it into your podcast gathering device application, whatever you use to listen to podcasts. And of course, you can always watch the video replay on my website too. So that becomes useful to have that there. Now, normally, we would have interactive Q&A available. It's through a service called Socrative. Unfortunately, Socrative hit a database problem yesterday and is not quite recovered. You can see the questions. You can, in your mind, select the questions. You can touch the question. You can do that on your device. But one of the things you can't do is to be able to actually answer the question. So I have no idea if you're able to see the answer to the I, if what you're answering the question. You can answer it, but I, I can't see it. So that's your real challenge is being able to make that work. That is that is a real issue, isn't it? So make sure as we're going through this, you understand I can't see responses this month. So hopefully this will be resolved next month when we start with our, no, our next set of, of questions and answers. But for, for the time being, if you'd like to see the questions up close, I'll, of course, show them to you on the screen. But you can see the answers at professormesser.com slash QA. That's a very quick way to get there, professormesser.com slash QA. There's also apps that you can download that will show you this as well from the Google Play, the Apple App Store. You put it on your mobile device, and that makes it very easy. One of the things that you will see then if you log in right now, I have a question for you. This is more of a sample question to see if you can get into the Socrative front end, or you should see a question waiting for you right now. And the question is, in 2016, approximately how million pounds of tart, tart cherries were produced in the United States? What an odd question for me to ask. Well, you'll know why I asked in a moment. But this is something I put the first question up so that you can see that you're logged in properly to Socrative. You can see the questions popping up. Obviously, this month, you won't be able to answer or submit the question, but you can see the answers that are there. And in fact, the answers that are there show this. They show 9 million, 59 million, 109 million, 209 million, and 309 million. What an, what an unusual question to ask about these tart cherries. And if you are in Socrative and you can see things properly, then what you will be able to do is answer one of these. You just can't submit it on this particular case. The answer to this, though, 
The reason that's there is the United States Department of Agriculture says that 309 million pounds of tart cherries were produced in 2016 in the United States. And the reason this is there is because today is May 17th, if you're watching this live. So on May 17th is National Cherry Cobbler Day. So of course I'm going to ask a question about cherries. Well, now you understand what you can expect to see in Socrative. You can, of course, understand what you can't expect to do in Socrative. But of course, if you go to professormesser.com slash QA, you can at least see these questions pop up. The Security Plus certification has been around for a while. The current version is the SY0401. This version of the exam, we're not talking about the certification, we're talking about the version of the exam. Uh, the exam version will be retiring in July of 2018. So next year, this is 2017 as we record this live. And, and since we're sitting at May of 2017, we've got well over a year until this version of the exam goes away. So we have plenty of time. Talk about a ramp. There's a if you're studying for Security Plus, keep studying. You've got plenty of time to take this exam and pass it before July of 2018. There's a new version of the exam that will be released. This, of course, means nothing to the certification. The certification is the same whether you, you take the SY0401 or the SY0501. You get the same piece of paper. The, the, the difference in the certification doesn't change at all. This is only a difference in the questions that will be asked of you. So the new version of the SY0401, the new version of the Security Plus exam is the SY0501, and it will be released on October the 4th of this year. So notice there's an overlap. At, on October the 4th, you'll be able to take both versions of these exams. You get to choose which one you would like. And then you've got until July of next year to continue to take the existing version. That's because if you're studying for the current version, it'd be awful if you had to get cut off right on October the 4th and you would have to take the new one. So CompTIA does this overlap of these two exams. The SY0501, a very different exam. CompTIA has released the exam objectives for the SY0501. And I would say about half the exam is different. It's a 50% change. It's a dramatically different exam. It is com structured completely different. A lot of material was removed. A lot of material was added. So this is not something like the A plus or Network Plus, if you're familiar with CompTIA's exams. This is not one of those situations where the exam itself is only slightly different. This one's very different. They took a bit of a different approach to the exam. A lot of the content will be familiar to you because it is security plus content. But the exam itself is something that will be very, very different. So I have a lot of work to do to get those updated videos out to you because it will be very different. Whether you take the 401 or 501, it's going to be pretty much the same exam experience. There will be a 90-minute exam. You, you will get a maximum of 90 questions. It might be fewer than that. It's a passing score 750 out of a range of 100 to 900. So we really don't know how the grading works. CompTIA doesn't share that information. And the questions that you get will be multiple choice, or they might be what CompTIA calls performance-based questions. Performance-based questions are questions that could be multiple choice, or, in the, or instead of multiple choice, they're fill in the blank. They're having you match things. They're having you put things in a certain order. It's a little bit more involved than a simple multiple choice question. So that's one of the things that we have to think about on the exam is this might be a little bit different than just sitting there and answering A, B, C, and D as we step through the exam. So it's something to think about as you're planning for this exam. In the chat room, people are asking, is the 501 exam more difficult? And uh, I would not. I would bet that it is not. I would bet the 501 exam probably has the same, uh, the same difficulty level, but we won't know until the exam itself is released. That's a little bit more of a challenge. So we just have no idea. So we'll find out when the 501, looking at the exam objectives, I don't think it will be more difficult. It's just a, a, a very updated exam. I guess I'll, when you think about it, in three years, a lot has happened in security. So it's nice that the refresh is really taking a lot of those things into account. If you'd like to know the differences, I will be writing up a document that explains in detail what these differences are. But you're welcome to download the SY0501 exam objectives now, and uh, you can try it out for yourself. So let's go through a performance-based question. If you were going to sit down for the Security Plus exam right now, one of the things that you will be faced with is uh, right off the bat, 
is not the multiple choice questions. You're going to get performance-based questions. So the performance-based question is the first thing I like to do when the study group is right here. And you can see this question, although you can't answer the question. You can see it at professormesser.com slash QA. So here's the question. Match the attack characteristic to the attack type. So I have a number of characteristics here that we can look at. We can see the website is unreachable. IP addresses are cloned to gain access. The URG push and fin bits are changed. Common passwords are attempted. And social engineering is in an email. So you can see we also have five different attacks. We have spoofing, phishing, dictionary, a DOS, whatever that is, and a Christmas tree, or an Xmas tree, as we say. So what we're doing is matching effectively the characteristic to the attack type. And since I have five attack characteristics and five attack types, these should match up one to one. You're not going to overlap. And there won't be any left over at the end. So if we were on Socrative and it was working, you would put, if you think they were all in order, the proper order right now, you would say A1, B2, C3, D4, and E5. So you might want to make a note on whatever you'd like to do. Open up a notepad, find a, what they call a pencil or a pen. You remember those. And then actually write down what you think the answers happen to be. And so you might think it's uh, A, A1, B2, C3. Just write those down, and you'll have an idea as we step through this what it happens to be. Folks who are just joining us in the chat room can see that Socrative has been having some problems since yesterday. They know that you can see things but you cannot submit things. So it's nice to be able to at least see those on your Socrative screen, but you're not able to actually push the button today. I'm not able to get any information on my side either, so I have no idea what you're answering. You effectively get a free month where I have no idea how you're answering the question. Only you know how you're going to answer the question. That's one of those things we'll just have to work through this month. So let's look at these characteristics and these attack types and what I think they are. Let's move them over here and have a look. If you'd like to get onto Socrative so you can see this a little bit better, it's professormesser.com slash QA. So here is the attack type and the list. Here's what I created on mine. So I said A4, B1, C5, D3, and E2. So let's step through these so that you really have an understanding of what I was thinking with these. So a website being unreachable one very common way or the most most common way that you will see for websites to become unreachable would be through a denial of service. That's what the DOS is. Very often it's a distributed denial of service, but we didn't have that option in our list. We just had DOS, and that's the one that fit the best for a website being unreachable. Answer B is an IP address uh, IP addresses are cloned to gain access. Well, that's clearly spoofing. That's what we do when we spoof this data. We are able to have this information cloned and pretend we're someone else. We're spoofing someone else in there. For C, the urgent push and fin bits are changed. That's absolutely a Christmas tree attack. That's changing individual bits that are inside an IP header. That IP header information is going to show you uh, a lot of other bits that are in there, but by turning some on and turning some off, uh, the idea is that it looks like a Christmas tree lighting up. As it's, we have the different lights going through the Christmas tree, and that's why it's named the Christmas tree attack. We're expecting to see what kind of response we can get from a computer because those three bits should not be turned on at the same time. So it would be interesting to see how a system handles this. These days, a Christmas tree attack, you usually don't see having any effect because almost everybody's aware of it. So the common networks are attempted. That's a dictionary attack where we're trying uh, 12345, Ninja, the word password. There is a nice dictionary of the most popular passwords that are out there, plenty of them to see. And social engineering in an email, well, that's phishing. We're certainly familiar with that. And whenever you're dealing with a lot of people using email, you're going to be concerned as, as a security professional with making sure that people are not clicking on links that would then send them to a site where they're putting in their personal information or authentication details. That's absolutely a phishing attack. So hopefully, you were able to match these up. I obviously can't see it because Socrative is having a problem today. But, uh, but I think you most of us probably did pretty well with that. And if you got any of them wrong, Maybe this is a good time to go back and look at the attack types that are listed in the Security Plus exam objectives. There are a lot of different characteristics and attack types that are out there. I only took a subset of them. There's many others that you need to know for the exam. So make sure you do that as well and being able to have those there.
So that should be a good thing to work through. So let's do another question. Since I'm talking to myself and have absolutely zero feedback this month, we're going to just really get through these pretty well. Uh, here's the first question that is a multiple choice question. So we're through the performance-based questions. This question is, which of these would be the best way to prevent a replay attack? I'd like to kind of kept that idea of the performance-based question. I said, well, let's shift our gears and really focus on one type of attack. This is another type of attack that we would run into and have available. Your possible options are A, segment the network with VLANs. B, track all changes to the routing tables. C, salt the password hash with a session ID. D, use an IPS to drop malform packets. Or E, lock accounts after a number of invalid password attempts. One of these would be the best way to prevent a replay attack. Maybe you know what these are, and you can step through these and understand what it happens to be. Now, this is one of an attack. This wasn't on the list we were just looking at. A replay attack is a different kind of attack. And this is one, whenever you're trying to step through it, that also comes is a little bit more of a challenge. This is one where you really do want to go through and think about the way these attack attacks work. Notice that the answers that you have here are not simply a description of what it or a definition of replay attack. It's really asking you to define and use how a replay attack would work. Again, I want to mention, don't, don't answer these questions in the chat room. You want to answer these questions uh, at least on Socrative today. You obviously can't submit it, but uh, keep those uh, answers to yourself. We will, of course, go through and look at all of the different answers that we have as soon as I give plenty of people to look through these and try to figure out what the answer might be. This is a very good attack that people will use especially in a, a pretty public area. So this is one you do want to be aware of. And of course, you want to be aware of how to prevent it. So really, that's what this question is focusing on and how you would look through these. Let's talk about what a replay attack is and how it works. Uh, let's take this scenario that we have here, where we have a workstation, we have a server, and then there's somebody in the middle of this who's also working through these. So maybe Maybe you know what these are and looking at these uh, scenario you've been in. Normally, you're sending information out to the network. In fact, it might be a wireless network. I'm showing this as wired. And the information is going to the server. But notice that you also get a copy of the information going to the bad guy. So if you are authenticating and this information is going across as a username and maybe a hashed password, not only did the server see this, but the bad guy saw this. Well, that's a pretty big problem because the bad guy is going to send his own authentication request, which is effectively a duplicate or a replay of what you just sent. So now that person is able to log in without your knowledge. You have no idea this is going on because it's on another type of, of connection that you are not involved with. So now the bad guy has access using your account credentials. Now, normally, you would not see this type of attack occur because people are already very aware of this type of problem. So what you're going to see most uh, developers do is they will create an authentication process that's going to not only use the session ID information or username and password, but they are going to, uh, to hash that information and use a salt. So that's very specific to the session ID. That way, when you are authenticating with the session ID information that has been, uh, or the authentication information that's been salted with that session ID, if somebody tries to replay that, they can't use the same session ID salt. Therefore, they will not be authenticated into the system. So a replay attack in the chat room, people are going, oh, this is man in the middle attack. It actually is not. This is somebody that is listening to what's going on. They're not sitting in the middle of a conversation. They're simply listening into a previous conversation. The actual attack is one that is done not in the middle at all. The actual attack is between one device, the bad guy, and the server. You're not involved at all in that scenario. So this would not be considered man in the middle. Uh, man in the middle is, uh, is something where the bad guy is always in the middle of the conversation, watching everything that goes back and forth has to pass through the bad guy. And in the, this particular case, it is not a man in the middle. A lot of people want to get that uh, difference into their minds because that's a very common question I get. Is, is a replay a man in the middle? Is a man in the middle a replay? No, these are very different in how they operate. So it's important that you know about how these would work as well. So if we look at our possible answers, 
which of these would be the best way to prevent a replay attack? Uh, segmenting the network with VLANs would not help at all from a replay perspective. Uh, tracking all changes to a routing table, that really doesn't help from a replay attack perspective. Using an IPS to drop malformed packets, there were no malformed packets in this conversation. Locking accounts after a number of invalid password attempts, there are no invalid password attempts with this particular issue because we have authentication information. We either have session ID information or we have a username and a hashed password. So the real answer here is C. We salt the password hash with the session ID as one of the ways to prevent a replay attack from occurring. Another way is to send it over an encrypted channel. That's a perfect way to prevent a replay attack because a bad guy can't see anything inside of the encrypted channel. There's nothing to replay. So that's another great reason to have some encryption in place. If you don't have encryption, or maybe on top of the encryption, you might salt the password hash with a session ID, which means only one person can use that because only one person can use that session ID information salted with the pass, uh, password hash. It's a great way to prevent a replay attack. So a very common way to do this as well. One of the folks on the uh, in the chat room, can we? Is this a reverse engineering type scenario? It is not. We aren't engineering anything. We are able to get exactly the information we're looking for and send it off to the server. There's no reversing here. There's no engineering. Uh, we are neither reversing nor engineering to make this happen. We're simply taking a copy of the information and sending our own version of it out to the server. What could be easier than that? Replay attacks, because of the knowledge that people have about replay attacks, these are not very common attacks that you will see. But the capability exists in the right scenario where somebody does not have the session ID hashed with a password or password hashed with a session ID. They don't have encryption in place. Maybe they're doing things in the clear. This is a scenario where, unfortunately, you can run into these uh, replay attacks. And so uh, don't think that it's something that's uh, always going to be there, but something you should always keep in mind as a potential if things aren't done properly. Let's do another question. Let's jump through this to another piece. Here's a one dealing with more of security policy, I guess. Well, maybe, maybe not. Let's see what the question is. Which of these would not be a common application management control mechanism? It's not kind of really not policy. This is more technical. Let's not answer in the chat room. You can answer to yourself today since we have these problems with Socrata. The possible answers are certificate, path, application name, network zone, or application hash. Which of these would not be a common application management control mechanism? Well, this is something security people absolutely do, is manage how applications are controlled. So how would you manage how applications are controlled? It's got to be one of these, certificate, path, application name, network zone, or password hash. Maybe you know what those possible answers are. Take your guess. You obviously cannot submit them today, but you know which one you're choosing and being able to work through these different pieces. Uh, if you are would like to see this, at least see those answers up close on your screen, you can open up a new browser window, go to your mobile device, and go to professormesser.com slash QA, and you will at least have the questions local on your mobile device to know which of these would not be a common application management control mechanism. It should be a, a good one to step through. So make your guesses, lock them in. Well, lock them in in your mind because we can't lock them in with Socrative today. But let's talk about application management. This is something you will absolutely run into as a security professional. Sometimes these application management can be done in a lot of different places, but there's a number of different ways that you can identify what application might be running so that you can then manage it. Some applications you may want to allow, some applications you may not want to allow. So this is where uh, usually there are policies in place that say you can only run these types of apps or these specific applications on your mobile device on your on your Windows desktop, on these other devices. So how would you how would you, from a technical perspective, know what application is actually running? Well, there's a number of different ways to do this. One way is with an application hash. As we know from our other Security Plus studies, a hash is a very unique digest of information that's created from a bit of information that was provided originally. So it could be a text message, it could be an email, it could be a file. We send that file or that text message or that piece of content through an algorithm that provides us 
with a hash. And that hash means that we're able to, to know exactly what application's running because only this application is associated with this particular hash. No other application shares this hash. And you can't recreate this hash by changing things with another application. It's a very unique identifier to a particular app. So you can have your content management system, your application management system, only allow the application to run if it matches this hash, if it doesn't match the hash, then the application won't run. Another way to do this is through a certificate. Many of us know that you can digitally sign applications. There may be an application you're running on your computer. In fact, if you're not running one that is trusted by your operating system, it says, well, you, it looks like you've downloaded this file. You're trying to run this executable. It doesn't have a certificate that I trust. Is it OK to run this? And then you have to make that decision. If your computer is set up to automatically trust that certificate, that's great. We can run the application. It has been digitally signed by the uh, the person who created that. So this is one where uh, it does help to have that there and be able to work through it. I think I think that's where you get into more of that PKI the, and being able to work through what a digital signature is. It's important to know these certificates come in pretty handy and working with them. A path, maybe only run applications if they happen to be located in a particular folder. And your particular folder is one that is locked down. Only uh, the, the administrators are putting applications into that folder that people are able to execute. It's another way to do it. And there may be one like a network zone. Applications can only run if you are in the, uh, the work zone or the home zone. But if an application is one from the internet zone, maybe that's an application you would not want to be able to run on your system. Probably a pretty good idea if we think about it that way. So knowing what those, there are other ways to do this, but those are the main ways to uh, manage what application is running and allow you to make decisions on whether an application is allowed or not allowed. So let's look at our answers. Well, we know the certificate. We were just talking about digitally signing the application. So a certificate is one way. Uh, to have this management control mechanism. We're looking for one that would not be a common application management control mechanism. So A would not be the correct answer. B, a path where we're putting the applications into a folder. That's a common way. A uh, network zone, we saw that earlier. Network zone was certainly one. We don't want to run things from the internet zone, for example. Application hash, the one we talked about, where we were creating a hash based on the, the binary of the application itself. The only one that would not be a common application management control mechanism is C, application name. Now, why would that be? Why would an application name not be a good way to manage the application controls uh, or control the way the application is running? Well, that's because we could change the name to anything. We could take the, the, the wow.exe and rename it to microsoftword.exe. And now it will run if all we're doing is checking the name. So we're able to take World of Warcraft, and now suddenly it's able to operate properly because it uses Microsoft Word. Probably a, a better example would be the bad guys renaming their malware.exe to Microsoft Excel.exe, to Chrome.exe, to Internet Explorer.exe. It's a great way to fool people into running these applications. So simply changing the name isn't enough. We know that people can do that very easily. So therefore, if we're looking for one of these that would not be a common application management control mechanism, would be C, application name. Hopefully, you got that one right. We were, I'm no idea if you got it right or not. We're not able to tell this month. But hopefully, if you got it wrong, you know why you got it wrong now, and you'll be able to get that right on the exam. The Security Plus exam is massive. There is a ton of information to know, not just technical details, but information about policy and procedure. It's a mixture of a lot of different things. It doesn't change the new version either. It's just as much on the new version and working through those as well. What I've done is gone through all of my videos. I have over 250 videos for Security Plus. I made them very short, so it's not like there's 250 hours of content, thankfully. That would be awful. You would never get through the videos if that was the case. But what I did was take all the videos, whether they're 2 minutes long or 10 minutes long, and I created a set of notes. So I've gone through every single one of these videos, and I've written down all of the content, all of the bullets that are in there. I've taken the graphics files. I've grabbed everything I could from every single video, and I put it into this document. In fact, this is the first one where people said, I don't want you to leave anything out. Put every word that's in there, every port number, 
everything dealing with OSI, everything, it's all in there. It's all in this PDF file. It's something that is also relatively inexpensive, $10 for you not to have to take notes. Maybe that's a, a good price right there, a good reason to spend the $10 right there. But it's something that you can use after you've read your books, after you've watched the videos. It's a great single source to go to that has everything in it from every single one of these videos. I spent a massive amount of time putting all of this content together so that you can have it and study from it and prepare for your exam. Should be the last thing you look at before you're going into the exam is this set of notes so you'll be able to see it. Um, this is something you can find at professormesser.com slash security CN, security course notes. And you can also find it on the Security Plus video page and from the pull down menus that are on my website and on the main page of my website. So I want you to be able to use these. And it's another way to help support the site. A number of you were nice enough to even say, I'd like to provide a donation. But I don't take donations. I prefer that you get something for the money that you spend. And this is my way to give you something back. And the $10 that you put towards this uh, the set of course notes also goes towards keeping the website up and running because we do have uh, multiple web servers, database servers, load balancers. We're putting this information on devices around the world so that you'll have faster access to it. And all of these things, of course, cost money. And I appreciate the amount of support you've shown month after month, well, now year after year in keeping this going. Thanks so much for your support of this. If you'd like to know more about the course notes, find them at professormesser.com slash security CN. Let's go to another question. Here's one dealing with SSO, whatever that is. If you think you know, keep it to yourself. Don't put it in the chat room. We don't have all of those there and being able to work through those. I think that's one where you should absolutely think about what the different options are for SSO. I have a few options available on the screen. Let's look at what our multiple choices might be. Which of the following would be the best example of SSO? Would it be A, SAML, B, Radius, C, RSA, D is LDAP, and E is 802.1x. One of these would be the best example of SSO. This is one where you absolutely want something to uh, address this. This is also a very popular topic whenever you're looking at the enterprise at your organization. Even a small organization would probably use, well, absolutely would use SSO. So this is something you should think about if you're at home you want to be able to use SSO. So this is one of those things that really does apply no matter who you are and what you're doing. If you're connecting to a network, this is, becomes very, very useful to be able to have that there. This is also one of those scenarios where there's not, a, not just one way to do it. There are many, many different ways to do SSO. And so this, these examples that I gave you that you can find by going to professormesser.com slash QA, these examples are, are a mixture of different things, but really only one of them is the best option to be able to do that. Maybe this is one where you've run into this and you've used this and then you're familiar with this, but then you have to know how it's implemented. Just knowing what the abbreviation is isn't enough. So let's see how we've done with this looking at SSO. Well, we can't see what you've answered, but let's look at these different options, SAML, RADIUS, RSA, LDAP, and 802.1x, and what this might be if we were to think about SSO. The only one that happens to be in this list that I think would be the best example of single sign-on would be SAML. This is the Security Assertion Markup Language. So this is one where it's a very standardized way for you to put in a username and password that is a single sign-on. It's a single username and password that you would work through. Uh, in fact, this is one where if you've been on a website and uh, they've said, oh, you can log in with a, the username and password you use for a third-party site. How is this site able to log me in using credentials that I put somewhere else? Well, it's using this very standard method of SAML so that a, you can use this one username and password and be able to gain access anywhere you'd like. That third party 
is taking advantage of these very large authentication databases from Facebook, from Google, and from many other places, from Microsoft. And so you can log in with your Microsoft ID. In fact, if you're in my chat and you logged in, you can log in with your Twitter login. You can log in with your Facebook login. You can log in with an authentication you created locally. So you've got options there. You can use something that you're already familiar with and you don't have to register again. The SAML configuration uses three different entities. One is a service provider. You need a client. That would probably be you being able to do this. And would be an identity provider, the one who actually has the credentials. So you would connect to the service provider and gain access to all of those uh, resources that are available by using a username and password that really came from somewhere else. So if we look at our list, why would these others not be a good example of a single sign-on. Let's step through what these are so that we can really get an understanding of that. Obviously, SAML A, if you answered A, you got this one correct. Well, if you answer B, RADIUS. RADIUS is used for authentication, but there's nothing in RADIUS that allows you to do single sign-on. RADIUS simply is a check for a username and password. Was I authenticated properly? And then I go to the next thing. If later on I need to authenticate for another service that uses the same RADIUS database, I still have to put in my username and password. There's nothing in RADIUS that really takes that into account. RSA is a type of encryption methodology. Uh, there's a lot of things associated with RSA. Not only is it a company, but also a type of, of series of encryption technologies. So that is not single sign-on, however. It may help you protect the data you're sending back and forth, but it itself has nothing to do with single sign-on. You've got uh, LDAP. LDAP is another way to access a directory of information across a network, very similar to accessing it from a RADIUS database, except it's an LDAP database. So again, no single sign-on associated with LDAP either. 802.1x is a way to have uh, the to lock down a physical interface on a switch or a network device uh, and be able to require a username and password to gain access to the network. But again, there's no single sign-on capability associated with that. It's more of authentication to the network. And then once I'm there, I can do other things. 102.1x may work in reverse. You may have an, uh, an existing database for Windows, for example. And when you log into Windows, it performs an 802.1x check. But 802.1x itself is not providing the single sign-on. So in this case, the best example and again, this is a very common language that CompTIA uses for these exams. The best example of single sign-on in our list of five is ASAML. Hopefully, that's the one you got there as well. Let's do another question. Let's shift gears into a technology for one-time pads. Which of these is most associated with a one-time pad? And this is another example where we have to understand not just what a one-time pad is. We have to understand the definition of it. How do you apply this technology? How do you use this technology and being able to, to take advantage of it? So I have some options for you. Which of these is most associated with one-time pad? Is it A, encrypted data is also digitally signed? Is it B, the public key can be given out freely? Is it C, the key should, should only be used once? Is it D, the symmetric key is transferred using asymmetric encryption, or E, the key is padded to increase the overall key size. A one-time pad. Which of these is most associated with a one-time pad? If you think you know, well, you can't answer online at professormesser.com slash QA, but you can answer to yourself. Make sure you don't put your answer in the chat room. We're going to try to figure this out on our own. Pretend you're sitting for the exam. You've been given these options. And on the exam, by the way, you should at least take a guess. You should never leave any multiple choice question blank. If you're going through it the first time, at least answer what you think the answer might be. And if you're not quite sure, you can always flag the question. You can click a, a box on the screen to flag it, and then you can come back to it later. So don't pass by it and don't put an answer down on these. You should at least answer it because on the exam, you'll probably get four possible answers. You got a 25% chance of getting it right, even if you have no idea. But if you have a little bit of an idea, 
then at least you're narrowing down what those possible options are. So that's my little tip for you today is never leave a question blank. Uh, getting a question wrong on the exam does not subtract points, as far as we know. doesn't seem to do that. So uh, leaving it blank, though, doesn't gain you any points. So make sure you at least take a stab at these and being able to work through all of these possible answers. So let's talk about a one-time pad and what this is. You may see it referred to as an OTP. Probably not. One-time pads have been around for a very, very long time. This is a technology that was built during the teletype time, so there was no SSL encryption. There was really not much of a way to encrypt at all, nothing that was standardized. But how do you send information in the clear that is in a form that nobody can read across these very public teletypes? Because anybody who was connected to the teletype could hear the traffic going by. So what we do, the pad, when we talk about a one-time pad, the pad is a pad of paper and being able to work through these. This is one where uh, it's a very simple encryption and decryption process that you can do on a piece of paper with a pencil, which makes it perfect for using on teletype systems. This is also extremely secure. This is not one that is you can you can analyze and put through some type of decryption mechanism and try to figure out how to break it. It's one that is effectively unbreakable unless you have the key. That key becomes incredibly important with one-time pads. The rules of the one-time pad is the key, unfortunately, has to be exactly the same size as the text that you are encrypting. So these keys can be pretty long. So it's not something that's very usable in the, the way that we do these things today. Uh, the key is also needs to be completely random in the way that it operates. And you need to only use the key one time. You don't want to have people be able to look at two different messages because then you're able to break down and discern what some of these key uh, options might be. It becomes pretty useful to have that there. And ideally, this is the only way to do it, you have a copy of the key, the recipient has a copy of the key, nobody else has a copy of that key. Pretty nice system to be able to work with. Those aren't horrible encryption requirements to be able to do this. Here's an example of a one-time pad. This is useful to see. I'll move my head out of the way so you can see this. We have A through Z, and we underneath have put the numbers 1 through or 0 through 25. Obviously, 26 letters in the alphabet will start counting at 0. So you're able to take something like a plain text hello. Now, what we do is I create a key that's randomized based on what I'm sending, in this case, a very simple message. It's only five characters, so my key needs to be five characters as well. And I just happen to choose a key of XMCKL. I just randomly chose some letters that were in there to be the key. And now what I do is I take those and perform a calculation on those. I change the hello to be the numbers that you would see, 7, 4, 11, 11, 14. And then I take my key and turn those into numbers as well using the pad that we've created. And we add those together, and this is our ciphertext and being able to work through them. So this is one where now I have some cipher. Notice how different 4, 16, 13, 21, 25 is very different than the hello plain text that's up there. Even the letters that were duplicated, we had uh, an L and an L right there as the third and fourth character. They're not even the same number anymore. So that's what we mean that it's one that's difficult to hack if we were to now put these back into letter form. This is the ciphertext that we would send. That's the word hello in the ciphertext of one time pad. So you have to have that key or you're absolutely not going to be able to get the word hello back out of this. So if we look at the answers that we have available, we can see that encrypted data is also digitally signed. Nope, it has nothing to do with a one-time pad. There's no digital signatures with one-time pads. The public key can be given out freely. There are no public keys with one-time pads, so that would not apply. The symmetric key is transferred using asymmetric encryption. There is no asymmetric encryption back in the days of teletype. So that's not the right answer. And the key is padded to increase the overall key size. No, not at all. In fact, the key size needs to be exactly the same size as our plain text. We're not going to increase the key size by padding it. The actual answer then would be C. The key should only be used once, because if you start to get multiple uh, messages sent, we can start out, uh, looking at these and trying to determine there is a way to start breaking down what the key happens to be. So always use a different key 
every time. Usually there would be a lot of predefined keys, and they would use a different key every time that messages was sent. That way you can stock up both sides with keys and then run through all the keys uh, and use them as you need them. So that is a one-time pad. Hopefully you answered C as well, that the keys should only be used once. On the Security Plus exam, there are topics dealing with one-time pad encryption or digital signatures or being able to set up a VPN or understanding how to configure a firewall. Somebody in the chat room was saying, how do I get some practice time to configure setting up a firewall? That's something you might run into. Well, the folks at GTS Learning have already thought of this. They've created labs for you that step through some of these scenarios. These, this also comes with GTS Learning's Security Plus book. So you're not only getting a study guide that is written for the Security Plus exam, a study guide that they use also embed my videos in their books as well, but they also have labs that can help you get some hands-on with some of these topics. These labs are using real systems, real operating systems that are virtualized in the cloud. They are always available 24 by 7. You don't have to have any additional hardware or software on your side. There's nothing to load up. You can do all of this in a browser. Uh, very easy to use. It's something that's interactive. It's screenshots. There are multiple systems you're using at the same time. This is a screenshot of a lab that has one, two, three, four, five, six systems, six different computers that are up and running. Imagine having six different computers on your desk trying to get this running or six different virtual machines on your desktop. It's almost impossible to get everything you need running. They've already done it. They've already got all the right operating systems loaded. They already have the lab scenarios set up. They've got step-by-step -step with screenshots as you step through these to be able to do it. All of this is available. There's Q&A that comes with this. You can see the whole thing that they've got ready for you at uh, professormesser.com slash sec labs. And you're going to want to use that link because normally, if you go to the GTS Learning website, it's $169. The special price is only available if you follow my link at professormesser.com slash SEC Labs. Security Labs is what that stands for. SEC Labs, SEC Labs. And that will give you an overview, tell you a lot more about the labs. And you can decide, oh, this might be something I can use to get some more hands-on before I walk in to take my Security Plus exam. I want to thank the folks at GTS Learning for their support. Great folks to work with over there, too. I've worked with them for years, and their customer service is fantastic. They're nice people to work with. I would not associate myself with them unless I really didn't like being able to have them as friends and partners and trying to get you through all of these crazy exams and trying to get your arms around what all those different topics would be. Learn more about this, professormesser.com slash seclabs. Let's move on to another question. Here's one. I'm trying to do more scenario-based questions on these study groups because those are the types of things that you will see on the exam. So here is a it's kind of a scenario-based question. It's a word problem. You want to look at it that way. You need to provide access to an internal server from an external IP address, but restrict the access for everyone else. Which of these would be the best way to accomplish this? And of course, I have some options for you. We've got an A, B, C, D, and E. Uh, the first option, A, we would add the external IP address to the firewall's ACLs. Or we would create an IPS rule for the external IP address. Maybe we would add the external IP address to the load balancer. Or perhaps we would add authentication details to the radius server. Or would we define a separate VLAN for the external IP address? Which of these would be the best way to provide access to an internal server from an external IP address, but restrict the access for everyone else. If you think you know, don't answer in the chat room. You want to go to Socrative to see all of those possible answers by going to professormesser.com slash QA. There's a lot of different components you're going to run into as a security professional. I'm speaking as a systems engineer who was, I was working as a senior systems engineer for a next generation firewall company for about seven years. So I saw a lot of different people's networks, a lot of different configurations. I was in some of the largest networks in the world looking at their security environment and trying to figure out the best way to protect them from all of the different threats that were coming from anywhere all over the world. So I got to work with firewalls, IPSs, load balancers, radius servers, VLANing, IP addresses, the whole mix, and much, much more. So we would always be faced with a challenge. How do we provide this security? Well, there's a lot of different ways to do that. Which way is really the best way? And that is indeed how this question 
is prompted, which of these would be the best way to accomplish this? That's what you want to think about, too, as you're trying to step through what all of these are. Again, this is another one of those questions when you're working through this that says, here's a scenario, so what would we do? Uh, this is one where also you need to not only understand what the right answer is, but why all these other answers would not be the best way to do it, which I think is one of those reasons they ask for the best answer. Because there are many ways to provide access to an internal server from an external IP address and restrict the access from everyone else. I can think of four or five ways to do this right now. But only one of the given answers is the best way. In fact, on the exam, you may think that a number of answers actually would be a way to do it, but that wasn't what they asked. They asked you for the best way to be able to do this. Well, I'm going to give you what I think the best answer is right now, and it's through firewall rules. This is incredibly important to know for the exam. Firewalls just keep coming up again and again and again and again on the exam. Uh, we allow or disallow traffic through a firewall based on a series of configuration parameters. We call these tuples in the world of firewalls. Uh, a tuple might be a source IP address, a destination IP address, a port number, the name of an application, the time of day. Uh, all of those are different tuples. And you can combine the tuples together to provide or, or to create even complex rules that would be very specific at allowing a certain source IP address, a certain destination IP address, a certain port number, a certain time of the day. You can put all these together, and the firewall, firewall rule has to match every single one of these tuples to be able then to perform whatever the response is if that firewall rule matches. Maybe if they all match, we allow the traffic. Maybe if they all match, we deny the traffic. That's effectively what a firewall is doing for us, is allowing or disallowing traffic based on our configurations. Firewalls are usually, uh, almost always, and probably the, the, the best way to, to, from a human being perspective to look at it, is we start at the top of a rule base and we work our way to the bottom. Firewall rules almost always work this way. Not always on, on Linux. There are certain firewalling type packet filtering techniques that don't work top to bottom or sort of work top to bottom. But for most of the firewalls you run into, that's how they work. So that's one way to, to go through it as well. Uh, these firewall rules can be very general. It could be, say, allow Twitter to, to run through our network. Or it could be very specific, very similar to the example I just gave where we have a lot of different options in there. Most firewalls are also what we call an implicit deny, which means unless there's a rule in the firewall, nothing goes through the firewall. So that's a that's a very tight security. That's exactly what you want in most organizations. You want the firewall to be so tight that unless you're specifically telling the traffic go through the firewall, it's not going to go through there. So that becomes very useful to have that there. So I'm sorry that Socrative is not able to give us uh, what we need today. Socrata is running at half speed today. They're not able to store the answers that you're putting in, but we can at least see the answers. So let's step through what they are, and I'll tell you why I think the answers would be the best way and why they would be perhaps not the best way to do this. So our answer, of course, would be A, add the external IP address to the firewall access control lists. That's a very common way to, come to describe the list of access inside of our firewall is having that there with an ACL. So you often see those two terms, a firewall and ACL, are very often combined with each other. Creating an IPS rule for the external IP addresses. IPSs don't usually allow or disallow traffic based on an IP address. A, a, an intrusion prevention system is usually looking for a known piece of vulnerability, a known set of network traffic that is associated with a vulnerability and is either allowing or disallowing that traffic through the network. So that's one of those that would not apply to this scenario. Adding an external IP address to the load balancer would only allow people to access a load balancer. And we don't even know in this scenario if the, the IP address we want people to access is even part of the load balancer. Load balancers, of course, will take some, a request into the network, and it will load, uh, split the load across multiple devices. If you go to professormesser.com, I have multiple servers that you're hitting because there's so many people hitting my website that I can't just have one server. I need multiple servers. But you're actually, in my case, you're hitting a reverse proxy somewhere in the world that already has some information cached. That reverse proxy is hitting my load balancer, and that load balancer is then splitting the load across multiple servers. And that way, if a, if a server goes down, 
I'm still up and running because I have other servers to take care of the load. Or I can even add additional servers later on. So in this case, a load balancer would not be and would really not apply to allowing access to or from a particular external IP address. There are often access control lists and load balancers, but again, we were looking for the best way to accomplish this. And almost always, you perform your security on a security device like a firewall. You normally don't trust or you don't focus on putting security on a load balancer. Let the load balancer balance the load. Let the firewall provide the security. Authentication details. Add the authentication details to the Radius server. We didn't even talk about authentication. So Radius server would not be the right answer there. And defining a separate VLAN for the external IP address. Well, the external IP address is on a, it's external to us. It's on the same big VLAN as everything else in the world. We don't have a way to split it out. And even if we did, adding it to a, a separate VLAN configuration somehow in our switch would not provide any additional security. So VLANs are great for organizing your network, splitting it up into other pieces, and providing a local layer of security. But VLANs don't help you if somebody's going across the network. It becomes a little bit more of a challenge to have that there. So if you answered A, add the external IP address to the firewall's ACLs, you got this one absolutely right. Now, if you are watching this study group for continuing education credit, you already have your Security Plus security uh, certification, or you already have your A plus or network plus certification, or maybe you just need these CEUs for another reason, then you can uh, send me a message to request a continuing education unit for this particular webinar. And one of the ways to do that, the way to do it, and in fact, you have to follow this exact process, is you go to the top or the bottom of the Professor Messer website. There is a link there for Contact Us. You click that Contact Us link. And on the message, the form that comes up, you would put your name, you would put your email address. Those are important, or I can't get the CEU back to you. I email these back to you. You would put that this is the May 2017 Security Plus Study Group. That way I'm able to check, because you are able to do this on replays as well. You can go back and replay all of my study groups and send me continuing education unit requests. So you want to tell me which one it is, which helps me find it later on. The Then you want to put a special code word in there, which lets me know you were watching this. And the special code word for this month is firewall. This is the code word you're going to have somewhere in that message. I read through these messages myself. It's not an automated process. It usually takes me a week, sometimes longer, this month to get these going. So one important consideration here is that you put that code word in there so that I know it was there. If you want to put something else, let me know that you were watching the study group or you have another message you'd like to send me. I'm the one reading them. So you're welcome to add anything else to that that you would like. I then... Go sit down in front of the TV, I pop open my laptop, and I start going through all of these, making sure that your keywords are correct, that you've submitted it in the correct way. And then I send you back an email that certifies that you must have been watching this. And then I digitally sign it so that you can't change the one hour of CEU to 100 hours of CEU. So sorry about that. I'm my, I use my public key, and I'm signing with my private key. You can confirm it with my, with my public key that's out there on the internet. Uh, if you'd like to. It's just uh, that uh, hash for the, the key, the digital signature is at the bottom of the email that you'll get. So don't be thrown by that. So pretty useful to have that there and being able to work through it. If uh, like in the chat room, if you have sent that in, you haven't gotten a response yet, uh, you need to contact me directly and find out what's going on with those. Uh, and again, I haven't had that in here to be able to there's, I think I'm a couple weeks behind at this point. So I apologize if you sent it in the last couple weeks. I will get to these probably tonight and working through all of these different pieces and having having all of these available. It's not, not, e not the easiest thing to be able to get all of these because you can imagine there are a number of these that come through. There's a huge number of these that come through. A lot of people during the week will ask me, uh, what is the most important thing I should know for my exam? And there is no most important thing. There is a huge list of important things. Every one of these things is probably as important as the other. Because you never know what the topic is that CompTIA will ask you during the exam. But fortunately, CompTIA is a little bit different than most organizations because they will put everything you need to know into a, uh, a document. Microsoft doesn't do this. VMware doesn't do this. Cisco doesn't do this. I don't think anybody else really does this. They will tell you exactly what you need to know before you walk into the exam. These are the CompTIA exam objectives. One of the best ways to get these is to go to the Google machine, type in CompTIA exam objectives, 
or you can go to professormesser.com slash objectives, and that will redirect you over to the right page on the CompTIA website. The objectives detail everything. If you know every bullet of every topic that is in these exam objectives, you use it as a checklist, you go through every single one of these, you check off, I know that, I know that, I know that, and you go through the entire mix, you're ready to take your exam, and you're going to pass it if you know every single one of these. CompTIA tends to stay very, very close to these exam objectives. Sometimes they go a little bit outside the objectives for one reason or another. But as long as you know what's in the objectives, you're going to pass because they stay very, very close to these. Even if they ask four or five questions that aren't in the objectives, which would be very unusual, you're still going to pass because the bulk of the exam comes directly from these. I mean, the vast majority of the exam comes directly from these exam objectives, if not close to 100%. So stick to these objectives. Be able to go through these and have an idea of where to check off what you know. And if you go through the list, you think, I don't know what that is, that draw a circle around it and go figure out what those pieces are because this is going to be your best way to know, am I ready for the exam? It's, you're going to know. If you know everything in the list, you're ready. If you know 75% of what's in these exam objectives, you're not ready. You need to spend a little bit more time to be able to do that. Pretty important. Make sure when you download these objectives from CompTIA, you're downloading the SY0401 objectives. The 501 objectives are available, but obviously the exam is not one that is available. You don't want to study from the, the, the wrong objectives. Right now, make sure that your books, that your study materials, that the videos you watch, that the objectives numbers that you are using today, May the 17th, 2017, is the SY0401 objectives. Pretty important to have that there. Well, we've gone through an hour of study group, but we do another one of these every month. And next month, we'll even be able to do q and I think, which will be nice for me. Uh, if you want to tune in to win that next study group, it'll be on June the 21st. So it'll be the third Wednesday of June at 12 noon usually. Make sure you check in the times. Sometimes the times will change. You'll know, or maybe you're watching a replay and we're well past June the 21st. You can check my calendar, professormesser.com slash calendar. There's also a link at the top of the Professor Messer website that shows what the calendar is, when the latest events are, what the next event's going to be, because I have an A-plus study group on the 7th of June. I have a Network Plus study group on the 14th and the Security Plus study group on the 21st. So you never know when the next event might be. And I might add some new ones in there. So the best way to always check in is on the calendar on the website. Don't forget that there's always something going on, though. You don't have to wait until next month. The 24 by 7 chat is always open and available on the Professor Messer website. You can, of course, see more about my course notes at professormesser.com slash securitycn. My YouTube channel, my Twitter, my Facebook, my Instagram. You can get to all of these that deal with social media by putting in professormesser.com slash the name of that thing. The it would be slash YouTube, slash Twitter, slash Facebook, slash Instagram. You get the idea. You'll be able to find me. And of course, there are links on my website that will get there as well. Don't forget about the 10% discount off vouchers. Don't pay full price for your vouchers. Go to professormesser.com slash vouchers. And don't pay full price for the GTS Learning Security Live Labs. Pay the special discounted price by going to professormesser.com slash Sec Labs. Well, we've come to the end of the first hour. You're more than welcome to stick stick around. I'll open up the phone lines. I'll answer interactive questions dealing with whatever. It's an open phone line. It doesn't have to be about Security Plus. It can be about the very important Destiny 2 live stream tomorrow. You can see where my mind is thinking about. But uh, I understand if you if you have to leave, we thank you for joining us. I will be here, though, for the next hour or so. Hopefully, you'll join us for the after show. And I will see you next time on the Security Plus Study Group. Thanks, everyone. Oh, I need a hot beverage. Well, thank you, everybody, for hanging in there with the Q&A. I apologize that Socranov had their database problems yesterday, and we weren't able to answer questions that were put in. But hopefully, we'll have that up and running shortly. Socranov will have it up and running shortly. I've got... A week off. I've actually got two weeks off this month because there are five Wednesdays in this month and I have three study groups. So I have an extra week off on this this month that's, that is uh, that is May of uh, 2017. So in three weeks, we'll do A+. Plus, and by then, if they don't have things working by then, we're in big trouble, aren't we? Well, let's get our phone lines up and running. I need to turn on my Skypey. 
and get dialed in. This is uh, what I do on my side. There are no uh, producers here. I'm my own producer. So I am logging in and getting there. Let's see if I can log into my call-in studio. Now my call-in studio is telling me that, no, you may not call into your studio. There we go. Let's host a show. Let's start the show. And I will call in and give you this phone number in just a moment. Actually, put up the phone number because you are able to dial in even though I'm not yet dialed into the phone number. Let's call the call in. Doot, 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 doot. Now I've got to make sure I type in the Thank numbers properly. Call in, call in uh, what do I do next? I do, uh, I do this, and I type that thing, and I click this. Enter your six-digit PIN number. All right. I'll put these in. And I'll type that thing, and I'll hit the click, and welcome. Welcome. There we go. Yeah, yeah I think you did miss the study code. We gave the study code out near the end of the study group, so that was uh, that's where it is. So on the GTS Labs, there are a way to get separate windows of the VMs and the text. Yes, you can pop open the text, move it to another window. You can put the VMs all in one window. You can use their old style. Uh, configuration, so you can have the VMs. When you click on them, they show up on the screen in one thing. There's a couple of ways to do it. So uh, there's there's a few. Yeah, you watched it all. There was a code there, in there, which is why why I have that code there. So I know if you I know if you were there. Boy, kind of frustrating today not having this Socrative. I apologize. It's kind of the fun part of the study group is kind of understanding what other people are answering. So. I'm sorry about that. It's one of those where it's a third party. It's out of our control. We have nothing we can do other than to hang out and see if we can make the best of it, which hopefully we did. We'll see if that's the case on here. But let's uh, get our phones up and running. We've at least got some people that are crazy enough to call in uh, or not or to terminate the call, as just happened there. So maybe they'll call back and have those pieces. The phone number, if you'd like to call in, 855-785-RJ45. Another way to think about this, uh, if you're on Skype, you can call them for free Skype. Uh, there's no minutes, no Skype minutes required on this. I pay for you to call in on these at plus one eight five five seven eight five seven five four five. This is a toll-free number in the United States. So in many wireless uh, mobile networks, there's no cost or no minutes used for a toll-free number. Sometimes there is. I guess it depends on what you're doing. From the chat room, uh, David's asking, is there a dummy-proof way to understand the OSI model, especially if you have no networking experience? There's, there's not. The OSI model is sort of a weird thing. If you've never touched the network, it's a really vague concept that is trying to apply a lot of, of ideas that you only learn after you've been working on networks a bit. So that is one where you really do run into a challenge if, you're, if you have no clue about networking because a lot of the terms in describing the OSI model are terms that are brand new to you. I have a video on the OSI model in the real world. Uh, I've combined that as with just understanding the OSI model on the latest Network Plus uh, set of videos where I take things that you can understand. So if I, uh, for instance, layer two, the data link layer, I describe what is on the data link layer. Well, it's this. It's things with a MAC address. It's a switch. It's a it's a network card. To try to take something that's in the real world and at least give you a concept of how that applies to the model. The model itself is not a, a perfect representation of the way the world works either. It's a model. It's something that gives us a basic overview of how networks operate. There are certain protocols that expand across multiple model, uh, multiple layers of the model. So you can't look at the model as a one-to-one. -one. It's not even a perfect representation of the way things work. It's more of a concept so that you can understand where these layers happen to be. So don't, don't worry too much if you're not getting it to start with. Once you start learning more about networking, I think it'll, it'll kick in for you and be able to understand those pieces of what's there. Let's go to the phones. We've got the 347 area code. Are you there, caller? What's your name? Caller, caller, don't hear you. The 347 area code. It may not be a 347 area code. It might be Skype, too. But that's what it shows on my side. I don't have a call screener. So all I know is here's a phone number. Yeah, hello? Hey, there he is. Hello. What's your name? Yeah, my name is Jesus. Hello, I'm Jesus. I'm calling from Brooklyn, New York. All right, Brooklyn, in the house. How are you, Jesus? <laughs> yeah, um, my question is on the, the 
uh, security plus notes. Yes. And I was wondering if you you said you were going to get them uh, actually the book like you did to the A plus. I did. And whatever happened with that, Jesus? <laughs> I don't know. It, I I never. <laughs> I never got involved. I never saw it. That's why I was wondering. It never you, appeared. You're, you're absolutely right. It. You're not missing anything. I do have these notes that are in a form, and I'm trying to put them in a form where I'll be able to make them into <laughs> this book. It is. It's something I've been saying for well over a month now, and I've got all these other projects going okay. on at the same time, and I'm trying to squeeze the Security Plus notes into something that's physical. And it, it's what it requires, just so you understand, is the entire set of course notes, which is – well over 35 pages at this point. All of those course notes are completely have to be restructured on the page. Uh, so it becomes a little bit more of a challenge to do this. I have to effectively rewrite okay. them. Um, have to move things around this page. Okay. It's it's a little involved. So it's just time consuming. And I need to sit down and, I, I and do that. So I apologize. It, I do have okay. plans to do you it. Give me time to study. <laughs> <laughs> so that's that's one of those. Give me time to get, get my study. Uh, yep. <laughs> so I apologize. You're not missing Hello? anything. If you're thinking, where is this thing? Okay. It doesn't exist yet. And that's why you're wondering. So sorry about that. Other questions for us today? Yeah, no, I just was wondering, when is the 501, is it going to be as different as the 401 or just about the same? You oh. said it was something about very different. Uh, the topics Possibly themselves, I, I, and in fact, I probably have some notes up that I could bring up on my screen. You obviously can't see it on the phone, but I may be able to find my notes that I've made so far that describe the things that are... I, I have two PDFs that I'm keeping track of. One of the PDFs okay. it shows me um, has shows me the things that are new, and the other PDF shows me the things that are not in there anymore. And there's a lot that's changed. I estimated to uh, you earlier that there was probably uh, probably half the exam was different. Uh, let's see if I can bring up, for instance on my screen what these happen to be so those of you watching i have the 501 exam objectives up on my screen right now everything that's green is something that exists in the old one and it's also in the new one so in this first section which compare and contrast types of attacks which is you know the first thing we're getting hit with is malware and attacks which is a very it's all structured completely different now um a lot of the a lot of green so that's good anything that's yellow are things that are new or have changed enough that there's going to have to be some updates to my content. And there's other things that are purple that are sort of new, but not really. But there's entire sections, for example, 1.3, brand new section. There, it's all new content. So you're going to find that there are huge sections of the, here's another one, 1.5, completely new content. So you, it's not even part of the 400 series. So I recommend people to go through here. There's another section, 2.1, not a lot of green there. A lot of yellow. I'm looking at it, yeah. So, so this is my challenge is wow. there's not a lot in here that uh, I can copy from. You know, I'm going to have to create a new course effectively because there's oh, so God. much in here. That's <laughs> too funny. Look at this. It's crazy. Now, when you get to the, wow, the back part of this, there's a, there's a little more. There's a little more green in 3.9. Uh, there's a little more green in 4.1 wow. and 4.2. But but it's uh, it's tough. There's a lot in here I'm going to have to be working through. So uh, when I say that it's very different, it's very different. Uh, half is uh, – I haven't calculated it, but half may be a conservative number. It may be more than half of it's different. Uh just a just a lot in being able to work through there. Just a just an enormous difference. So uh, I will be working on that, and there will be new videos, and there will be another course. But right now, it's just a matter of uh, of getting all of that content done. I create the course prior; the entire course is done before I start shooting. So I don't just do the first video and shoot the first video and make the second video and shoot and shoot the second video. I create the entire course. And then I shoot all the videos. So that's my first step is to do exactly that, is to go to the videos and uh, and work through all of those things. It's uh, it's a little bit of a challenge in getting that there. But 
I, I like the new structure. I think they did a pretty good job at really focusing on what was important from a security perspective. And they got rid of a lot of things that I probably did not need to be in the Security Plus uh, exam. So overall, I think it'll be good. It's just going to be very different. You're not going to be able to use your 401 materials to study for the 501, no question. The 501 objectives are available for download on the CompTIA website. If you just say that you want to download Security Plus objectives, they're in there, or they at least they were. I grabbed them when they put them available. They may not have meant to make them available, but they did. They stuck them out there, and that's where they were. Okay. I got another question. Sure. Um, cyber attacks is certification. Is that important? Because there was something about worldwide. I don't know if you heard about it. They had something about a cyber attack from just the terror, you know, group, you know, for certain uh, computers and stuff like that. I don't know if you heard about it. Would you be having that course by any chance? Well, there is a, there are new courses from uh, from CompTIA. There's a, a cybersecurity uh, a professional or not professional. What is the CSA plus? The cybersecurity uh, um, analyst. Uh, the CompTIA Cybersecurity Analyst is their new certification, which is the CSA+. Plus. They also have an exam on top of that, which is the CASP uh, exam. So they have actually above Security+, Plus, CompTIA has two other security certifications on top of that. I don't have any current plans to add additional certifications for CSA+, Plus or CASP uh, on those. But there is um, – there's – there. The security market for certifications, there are a lot of different certifications out there, not just industry kind of certifications, but some that are specific to manufacturers. So you can go to Palo Alto Networks and get a Palo Alto Networks firewall certification. You go to Checkpoint, get a Checkpoint firewall certification. Uh, those are very specific wow. certs. Um, my goal currently from a security perspective is to provide Security Plus. And if any of those others become popular enough because some of these are relatively new then i'll i'm of course kind of looking at those to see how they go but it, they haven't quite hit that popularity point for me quite yet to make me want to jump in there but maybe they will maybe they will in the future okay all right thanks thanks for your time and uh, you're doing a hell of a job there. thanks jesus i appreciate you calling appreciate you you're, you're helping us thank you thank you sir that's uh there's a lot. The, the security market for certifications is an interesting one. I could talk an hour or more and have about those uh, and being able to work through them. Uh, let's go to the phones. The 540 area code's been holding for a while. Thanks for holding. What's your name? I can, I can hear me. Hi. Are you there? Hear me. Hi. Are you there? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. There's a little bit of an echo on your Skype, and it's not quite kicking in with the echo cancellation, but go ahead with your question. Okay. Um, I have you on speaker, so I'll try and take you off. Well, I just passed my Security Plus two weeks ago, and that's with less than two months of study time. So I'm really thankful for all the help you provided. Nice. Congratulations. And that happen for me. Congratulations. Um, I also had a question. Um, I had plans to go for a Linux Plus certification, and probably sometime next year and just take my time studying for it. So I wasn't really sure um, if you have any content for that or could recommend similar content that's existing to what you provide. I think you've made a good choice at going to the Linux Plus certification. I think that's a good next step for people that are interested in kind of fits a couple of different places. It's used in every organization as some Linux. So if, and it's hard to find good Linux people, so it's a good one I think a lot of people go into. There's a nice security perspective to this as well because a lot of the security tools you use will be running in Linux. Uh, there's there's a number of them running Windows as well, uh, but you'll find that in the security world, there's a lot of different operating systems that are used to accomplish a number of different things. And if you're doing firewalling or you're performing uh, some type of log analysis or you're, you're creating reports, a lot of those things are already done in Linux. So it's, it's an excellent next step. And um, a lot of people ask me, what should I do next? And there's probably a list of things, but I, I can't answer that question for everyone. I think that everybody needs to think about where they want to go 
and what they want to do next. If you're doing security, you should know networking extremely well, and you should know operating systems extremely well. That's a good next step. So uh, the, to, to your questions, however, which is, do I have any Linux Plus content? I, I have a few videos that I've created that are Linux-centric, but I do not have a Linux training course available, unfortunately. So there are other providers of training courses out there. I don't have any specifically that I can recommend because I haven't seen them. I don't usually go out and try to try to look into the things I don't have. Uh, but there are a lot out there that people are using. And I, I speak with a lot of people that are going to different universities and colleges that need their Linux Plus certification. A lot of the folks at WGU, they might be some good resources if you know anybody there. Uh, they have a really good um, uh, Reddit subreddit there. A lot of you can read through what a lot of people are doing there because they have to take their Linux Plus certification. That might be a good resource to get some feedback on those pieces. And other other uh, organizations that are training on that would be good as well. There is um, I, I'd love to do more Linux Plus videos. It is a extremely large certification. And when I started doing the Linux Plus videos. I wasn't getting quite the feedback that I was hoping for, and I ended up doing about 12 or 15 of those before I decided to, that's enough for now, and maybe we'll come back to it later, but hopefully we'll. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll have a look at it in the future, and we'll be able to circle back to it. Okay. Well, again, thank you very much for your help. I got my A+, plus, then my Network+, plus, and I found you while I was studying for the Network+, plus because I was really struggling, and... I'm pretty sure I probably wouldn't have passed the Security Plus in such a short time without your help. So thank you. Fantastic. Congratulations. I'm glad we were able to help. And uh, good luck with the Linux Plus. I think that's going to be a great one for you to go through. Thanks for calling, too. That's, um, that's one of the challenges you do run into is trying to decide where to go next. Uh, nobody can answer that for you. People ask me, where should I do next? I don't know. What do you want to do in your life? Where do you want to go in your world? You have to figure out where you want to go and then figure out how to get there. The certifications is how to get there. That, that's not The certifications is not your goal. If it is, you're not doing it quite right. You need to figure out what you want to do, where you want to go with it, and then figure out what stepping stones you need to be able to make it across that stream. Let's go back to the phone lines and go to 559 area code. Are you there? Caller, what's your name? Hello, this is Kivyas calling you from Zambia. Oh, hello. Welcome, and thanks for calling again. Hi, what can we do for you? Fine. Uh, just to appreciate you, Professor. Uh, nowadays, because of following you and uh, all these programs you have, watching uh, your videos online, it has really helped me to be, like, security conscious. Yeah, but I uh, just to to get your thought on, uh, I see I'm, I'm sure you heard uh, about this uh, ransomware WannaCry virus. Oh, yes. Which has been, like, uh, affect, yeah, affected most of uh, the world computer users. So I, I'm kind of, like, trying to find out uh, on how can you advise someone who is, like, new to IT as me because we are mostly prone to such attacks. What are some of the best practices, so to say? The, the, uh, this latest bit of malware, this ransomware that, has, uh, that really hit last week was an enormous problem because of the way that it was able to propagate itself. It was effectively a worm. It did not need any human intervention. Once it got started, it could hop from machine to machine to machine without any type of human intervention, which was, uh, it was due to a very significant vulnerability in Microsoft Windows that was actually patched in March. So if you had already to, got your system and updated it to the latest set of patches, you were not subject to to being hit with this particular piece of malware. This and it's a very it was a pretty bad ransomware because of the not just the fact that it got on these systems because but because of how easy it was able to get onto all of these systems and do it without any type of user intervention. So the first best practice is always keep your system up to date with the latest patches. Had you been patched, you would not have been attacked. But one of the things you, you notice is one of the first big stories about this that came out was in the uh, the EU, uh, the, the hospitals were hit, seemed to be hit the hardest. Everybody was getting hit. But the hospitals in, in the UK got hit really, really hard. 
and people were asking why, you would think the hospitals would be the ones that would be most protected from this kind of problem. But you've got a series of challenges in something like healthcare. One is that you are doing the least technical thing in the world in a hospital. What you're trying to do is keep people healthy. So there is no computer involved. It's a human. Uh, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a technical computer person married to a nurse. So I probably get this more, I get this comparison probably more than other people. She had really is not a computer person, but boy, she knows the human body and can fix things. So the hospitals, their job is to fix the humans. They're not necessarily super concerned about the technical side of things. Compound on top of that, that a lot of the systems used in a hospital, like the systems that are designed to do x-rays, are probably using an embedded version of Windows. Now, creating uh, and using these tools to be able to do x-rays is extremely important. You do not want these devices not working. It's literally a life and death scenario. We weren't able to get an x-ray, so we couldn't tell there was this kind of problem. So this person passed away. They died because we weren't able to give them the proper type of care. So they have, they have these very specific process and procedures in a hospital to when you can upgrade an operating system on these types of systems. They have to be tested. You have to run them through the applications. You have to talk to the uh, the companies that make these products, see if they have given the check mark to install it on these embedded systems. Quite a huge process to go through, and it takes time. And while that time is ticking away, the bad guys have an opportunity to create a piece of malware that's able to take advantage of this vulnerability and ultimately create the problem that we saw. So there's some also some best practices. First, keeping updated is the good one. Uh, being able to do this in a timely manner is also a very good best practice. And another one you can think about um, is that from a best practice perspective, are there other tools you can use to be able to block these things? Uh, for example, the way that this particular worm moved around on these systems is using a vulnerability in an older version of Microsoft Server Message Block, which is the way that Microsoft systems use to transfer files and to print. The way that they send data from one computer system to another in Windows is using SMB. And this took advantage of a vulnerability in SMB version 1, which is really not a version most people use anymore. Most of the latest versions of Windows are going to, and I mean really the many different latest versions of Windows, are going to use later versions of SMB. So most people would have already turned off the computer's ability to use SMB1, and that was another best practice for keeping this from being able to propagate itself across systems. Obviously, if you already hit, that doesn't help you very much, but it keeps it from continuing its process from going to machine to machine to machine. This is one that, um, that unfortunately, people found out too late. Uh, they were able to, to work through some of these challenges. But you can also block some of these protocols at your firewall. There's not many places that would allow SMB to get through their firewall. There probably are some that, that do allow it for certain types of applications. And that's the one where you, you're you're really in a challenge. So you know, we're referring to the the WannaCrypt uh, that some people have abbreviated to WannaCry because that's what it made people want to do. But the WannaCrypt is the one that really did create this, use this vulnerability in SMB v1 to be able to go back and forth. So think about all the people that aren't keeping their systems up to date. Maybe it's time to minimize the security of of the, the type of attack vectors available on your machine. And if we can get rid of protocols that we aren't using, that's another best practice. So we've got updating our systems, getting better processes for updating these systems, and then really minimizing the attack profile that we have there so that there's not as many things for people to be able to take advantage of. And hopefully that will help some people in the future too. Thank you so much, Professor. Such a study groups like this one, they help me keep our work always and alert to some of our security vulnerabilities that are there in the, as far as IT is concerned. Thank you so much. Thank you. So appreciate your calling. That's uh, uh, quite a challenge, though. If you've got to try keeping up with this, as somebody who worked as a systems engineer for a next generation firewall company, these types of problems happened a lot. This one happened to be very, very popular and in the news because it was so widespread. These things are happening all the time, just not at the scale that we happen to see with WannaCrypt. So one of the things that uh, people are 
are always trying to do are get their IPS uh, updated to keep their firewall updated, uh, doing all of these things. It's a it's a challenge, and um, and there's just going to be another one. Maybe by now, though, everybody has updated their Windows system so that even if a new version of this particular new variant of this particular malware, this ransomware suddenly appeared, now they aren't going to be able to use the same method to get into and move around these systems. So maybe the next one won't be so bad. I'm working through those. Let's go to uh, a Florida call, the 850 area code. Are you there, caller? What's your name? 850, are you there, caller? Oh, wait, I need to turn up the volume. Maybe I'd be able to hear you. Are you there, caller? Yay. Hey. Can you hear me? I can. What's your name? Yes, my name's Eric, calling hey. from North Florida. How Hello, are you? Eric. I'm, I'm, and I'm, call, I'm calling you from North Florida as well. How are you, sir? Oh, well, perfect. <laughs> Good. Hey, hey, just wanted to say thanks for everything you do. Uh, passed the uh, Network Plus uh, about a month ago, studying for the Security Plus now. That's nice. That's kind of why, why I'm here today. But I uh, have a question, or more, more so to get your opinion on something, because as I've been, I've been tasked with getting a security certification, uh, Security Plus just stood out as the CompTIA's Security Plus sure. stood out as, I guess, the, the, you know, the route to go. But as I started digging into it, I noticed that there – that this isn't the only security certification that's available. And so a question I, I have is, uh, is, is, I guess, why is it that there are so many or, and or <laughs> which is, is better than the other? And I know you said before you could go on and on, and, I, and I'm not asking you to kind of, you know, go too far off, but I'm just curious. I'm kind of new to this and just wondering why, you know, why there's such a diverse field here. I think probably the the best answer is that security itself is an extremely broad field, and it's one that has grown dramatically in the last 10 years. It was already extremely popular before that, uh, but there's been this explosion of, of the need to have these IT security uh, goals and objectives for these organizations. Because security is not just on the IT side. Uh, there's also a huge security emphasis on the computer science side. And for those of you that have watched my study groups before, we really do separate these technology areas into two different piles. There's the computer science, which is generally focused with programming development and the creation of these, these systems that we use. And then there's the other part of technology that's information technology that's effectively everything else. Managing the operating systems, getting the servers up and running, connecting the systems together, and securing all of them as they're running. Uh, we tend to put the, the programming side off on the side a bit because it is so very different. It is its own science. That's the reason we call it computer science. And the IT part of it, uh, and neither one is more important than the other, but obviously there's a security emphasis on both of these. We need secure applications. We need to make sure that people aren't able to use uh, uh, some buffer overflows, to use cross-site scripting, to be able to do database injections. Those types of protections are handled at the, at the application level, and our administrators should be doing that. But there is another side of this that is also massive. How do you protect a Windows operating system? How do you protect a Linux operating system? How do you protect a network? How do you implement of uh, an IPS, a firewall, how do you do that in a way that maintains uptime and availability? How do you manage your dynamic routing if you have multiple firewalls? Do you have multiple uh, multiple ISPs coming into these multiple firewalls? How do you handle those flows? What about your IPsec tunnels out to third-party organizations? How do you protect and make sure that people aren't sending credit card numbers, social security numbers, people's private information over these links? And how do you do it if it's all encrypted to begin with? That's just a tiny little sample of the need to have security on a network. And so now you're starting to see why there are so many different security certifications that have an emphasis in different places. There are almost, uh, you can really put the security certifications into two buckets, or I tend to do it. One is that you have security certifications that are more generalized and are not specific to a manufacturer's product. So something like Security Plus, CSA uh, Plus, and CASP from CompTIA, those are certifications that 
have certain products that are used, but it's not like you're becoming proficient at a particular manufacturer's product just by getting that certification. You see similar things with certifications from SANS. Uh, SANS has a huge number of certifications you can get. SANS uh, has lots of webcasts they do. They have tons of really great training programs and certifications that they do. And you have others from other third parties uh, the, that are available. Uh, you've got the uh, OSCP for Offensive Security Certified Professional. You've got Certified Ethical Hacker. Um, there's, there's so many different ones to choose from, and all of them have a little bit of a different emphasis. Once you get out of the world of the generalized security certifications, then you have the manufacturer-specific certifications, which in some cases are just as important, if not more important for some employers, because it means you're very proficient in a security technology. So you might go to a Palo Alto Networks and get their Palo Alto Network certification. You might go to Checkpoint and get a Checkpoint certification. Cisco has a Cisco security certification. So it just depends on what, manu what uh, your employers are looking for. It depends on what you need to manage on day-to-day. -day. It depends on what you want to do next with your career. And I got I admit, uh, I'm with you. There's so many different ones to choose from. It's almost uh, overwhelming to try to figure out where you would go with the next steps. You almost have to rely on what other people are looking for to be able to know where to go next. Uh, a lot of people say, I'm working towards my CISSP. That's what I want to do. Others say, I want to be more proficient in the Cisco world. Again, it comes down to where are you trying to go? These are going to be the stepping blocks that get you to that final location. Did I lose you, Eric? Eric's over it. No, no, no. Eric's not. I mean, okay. No, I'm, I just, I, I'm <laughs> muted. Yeah, just so it didn't make any noise. So, okay, and, and I, get, I get that. So there's, and I, and I guess this is an opinion question. But is there a great difference between, say, CompTIA Security Plus and, say, SANS is, uh, I, I think, is it the CISSP? Is that, are they equal or? CISSP better? is from uh, ISC Squared, yet another organization. SANS has a completely different okay. set of trainings and programs and uh -huh. their own training classes. Uh, there is quite a bit of difference, though, between CompTIA, okay. uh, SANS, ISC squared, uh, OSCP, and all these manufacturers and what they're doing. Uh, it's really a focus on what are the differences and things that you need to know as a security professional. Um, I, there are advantages and disadvantages to the content they're providing. Some of them require more hands-on. Some of the SANS classes, you're actually attacking a system. You're finding the vulnerabilities. You're performing vulnerability scans. You're trying to get into the operating system. Other classes like CSA Plus or how to use some of the tools that you would use to maybe identify that somebody is attacking your system. So there is a it's a very broad set of tools that are available out there. Someone in security could spend their entire career learning how to use and really take advantage of a single firewall. And I, I saw this when I worked at Palo Alto Networks is that you could spend a career just doing that. It's an incredibly complex product with many different capabilities. It applies across many different parts of the network. It is extremely detailed in how it operates. You could spend your entire career just trying to figure out and make that thing work. Other people are focusing on log analysis and reporting and finding the bad guys before they get into the system. Other people are focusing on intrusion prevention systems. Um, it just depends on what your employers are looking for and maybe what you as an individual would like to do in your career. I was lucky enough to work at Palo Alto Networks. I just did firewalls. I didn't have to worry so much about the other things on the tertiary side of that. So I didn't have to spend a lot of time on the log analysis or a lot of time on vulnerability scanning because I was really focused on the firewall side of things. And you can make a career out of that, that all you do is that one thing. And that's, I think, one of the beauties of this information technology is you find a thing that interests you, you can just do that and, and run with it. You become very proficient and you've now got skills that people would like to hire you for. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Thanks for calling, Eric. That's uh, that's one of the things I like about IT. 
is that there there's a uh, the sky really is the limit on this. You can just decide what you want to do. There was no next generation firewalls when I started getting into technology. There were token ring networks and there was DOS. There wasn't even Windows really yet. There's a Windows 2. Windows 3 had not even come out yet. So Windows 3 is when things really took off with Microsoft Windows. So it's it's remarkable how you just follow the way the industry is going. You eventually end up finding the thing that interests you and doing those pieces. Let's go back to the phones to the 559 area code again. Are you there, caller? What's your name? I hear you, caller. Are you there? Hello. Hi, what's your name? Yeah, I'm here. Yeah, my name is Shazay. How are you? Very good. Thanks for calling. What's your question? Yeah, basically, my question is, uh, like, I mean, if uh, someone who has entered the IT field and, uh, you know, uh, is still in the process of uh, finding out what's the best career to go for, so how do you advise him to, you know, go to what kind of, uh, you know, material he should study and how to... Because I've been following your seminars and, and uh, been looking uh, to all of your videos that you've been posting as well. So, you know, how do you, you know, say that what kind of videos should he be watching? What kind of materials is important for him? It's a, it's a good question because you never know where people are going to go with in, in this world of IT. It sort of falls, follows the, the, uh, the question that Eric was just asking earlier is that, I like to put my videos together in the structure for a certification. I could have just made technology videos. That was one of the things I thought of doing. I'll just make a video on Windows. This week we had a pretty big security event. I could make a video on the WannaCrypt wor uh, worm, the WannaCrypt uh, uh, malware and ransomware, and I could make a video on that. So it would be very timely. Um, and make videos just on other technologies. But there are a lot of people doing that. So I focused instead on making videos that were based on a certification. So now the question really becomes, what do you want to do in IT? And that's a question that I can't answer for anyone. But usually, A-plus is a good place for people to start. If you already know a lot about operating systems and hardware, then networking is probably a good place to start. Network Plus is a really good one to start with because it gives you that foundation you need that can then be applied to anything. I often call the Network Plus certification the universal translator of certifications because you can use that networking knowledge whether you work on databases or file servers or web servers or internet connectivity or security. It all touches the network. So anything that's going to be dealing with networking, uh, anything in IT has a network component to it. Even application development has a network component to it. So that's one of those things that I think everybody has to think about what they want to do next. And then, of course, my videos are in an order that you can start at the top and just work your way down the objectives and what you're trying to do. So the question you should do is maybe think to yourself, is there a path I would like to go on? Usually once you're through the A+, and through the Network+, plus, you kind of have an idea of what technologies interest you the most. And I recommend that people follow that ID in their head. If you really like file servers, maybe they should get some Microsoft certifications. If you really like security, maybe you should get some of the security certifications. If you really like networking, maybe do some more Cisco and try to get something that's very uh, networking centric. It's really going to depend on what interests you. And I think that's the best way if you're talking long term in this industry, find something that interests you. That's the best way to go about looking at it. Okay, that's a very good uh, sort of an answer, and I think uh, yeah, I have I have interest in networks, and uh, uh, probably uh, would definitely go for a you know a plus and network plus, and see you know how it goes. Uh, thank you so much for your answer. Thanks for calling. I think that's a good place to start. Uh, good luck with that. It's, I think it's a great place to start. The idea of knowing what to do next is a challenging one. The benefit you have is. It doesn't matter so much in the big scheme of things. I can tell you that my Windows 3.1 certification I got, even before that, I got certified in Apple Talk and Land Manager Communication, two technologies you don't run into ever anymore or anywhere. So, but but the what we're doing now has built on those. So even things that you do today, 20 years from now, these technologies may not be around. But that's okay. You've already built on those, and you're just going to follow the path wherever it happens to go. You just never know. 
Let's go uh, back to the phones to, let's see if we will go back to the phones, the 248 area code. Are you there, caller? What's your name? Hi, Professor Messer. Hello. My name is Malad. Uh, I'm, hi. Hello, Malad. Hello. What's your question? Hi. Uh, my question is, um, uh, I'm a, uh, just graduated from a uh, uh, community college uh, with an associate degree, two years. Nice. Um, and uh, I don't have uh, working experience. Hmm. Uh, so I just want to make sure uh, what kind of certification um, I, I have to obtain um, and what kind of job I have to apply for. Uh, my major is a network security specialist. Nice. So uh, do I do I have to apply for a job like uh, help desk support, which is uh, like lesser than my my, my degree uh, network security, or I have to get like network plus certification, security plus certification, and apply for these kind of jobs? Do you think? Are you are you uh, are you planning any additional formal training? You got your AA degree. Are you thinking about maybe another extra two years to get a a major at a university or something like that? Or are you now jumping into the job fields? Um, uh, right now, I'm thinking of getting a job um, uh, as well as certification. Okay. Uh, one of the things that is probably universal, maybe not one hundred percent universal, but it's a very common start in most organizations is at the help desk. It is usually um, a role where the the employer can not only train you in the things that they do in their organization, but they can see how you work with other people. They can see how well you uh, work in some of these technical problems that you run into, and they know. Uh, if they're going to hire from within, this is a good place to try it out. It's a lot like the pro teams aren't going to send you up to the big leagues straight away. They're going to send you to a farm team. They're going to see how you bat. They're going to see how you field. And if you're somebody they think can really work in the big leagues, they're going to pull you out of there and put you into the normal organization. And that's a probably a good way to look at help desk. Uh, I got, when I got my degree, I got a four-year degree in business management. My first job out was working at a small computer company in South South Miami, effectively delivering printer cables. Um, I worked and got a four-year degree in business management so I could get in my car and drive around Miami all day and literally hand people printer cables and plug in monitors. And I thought this was not exactly what I had in mind. Um, and But that's kind of how your first job always is. Your first job is usually the worst one. Um, that, that's not always true, but often. That's usually your worst one. It's the one where you're really in that grunty work kind of mode. You're trying to prove yourself. And there are things you can learn in those scenarios. Help desks are a great place to start. My role there, I was in that computer company about nine months. And then I worked, I hopped and worked for a larger company that I happened to service. I worked for them for five years. It was an insurance company. And I worked in the help desk to start with. And I worked in that help desk well over a year. It was a corporate help desk. There were a lot of different technologies at this company dealing with mainframes, dealing with uh, middleware. You had uh, file servers. There wasn't any internet connectivity to speak of, but there was plenty of wide area network connectivity and frame relay networks and point-to-point -point networks and voice communication and a lot to learn. So at the help desk, you get to touch all of that. And what a great place to start learning. Um, and I kind of surprised people because they sat me at the help desk and said, you have to support this application. I said, where's the manual to this application? And they said, I don't know. No one's ever asked to see the manual before. So I had to go find where the manual was so I could read it and understand everything there was to know about this application that communicated to this middleware box that then talked to the mainframe. It was so unknown that it turns out nobody in the organization really knew how this thing worked except me. And all I did was read the manual, but nobody had thought of doing that. So when errors would pop up or things would change, I would call the people responsible for the middleware and say, we just had an error 18 on this. It says that we could change this configuration parameter to make this better, but I can't do that. So let me pass it off to you so that you can make those changes. They say, what? What do we have to do? Tell me again. Uh, and they would make the change, and they do it off hours, and I would come in off hours and watch them make the change and watch them reboot it. Or they were rolling out a new set of workstations. They need somebody to set up computers. Anything they wanted to do, I wanted to be part of. And I think the people in the help desk that are there and show up 
and I want to know more are the ones that are going to move up in the organization. You have to be able to learn and be a sponge, and that's a great place to do it. Does it directly apply to all of this formal training that you've gotten? No, it doesn't. But you're going to be able to use that down the road. Ultimately, I was able to use my business management degree because I'm running a business. It just took... 25 years for me to get to that point because I just got in this in the technology world and I loved it so much and I didn't want to be a manager. I, I was an SE manager at one of these places I used to work for some time and realized I hate this. I got a degree in this. This is awful. And I went back to being a systems engineer where there was less responsibility and more money. So that for me was the place to be. And ultimately I decided I want to do something on my own where I don't have a boss um, or the only boss I have is the one I'm married to. So let's do that. And that that ultimately is where I was able to use my degree. But don't don't be dismayed that suddenly now I have to go into a a lowly help desk position. The help desk is going to be entry level, but it's only lowly if you make it that way. It's a huge opportunity and one that you could use to not only move up in an organization you're in, but you could possibly use that as a jumping block to move to a different company in a non-help desk role, making a lot more money. So it just depends on what your goals are, what you're trying to do, what your geography can support, what organizations are near you, and uh, and and try to figure out where you want to go. And it should be relatively easy then at that point to figure out where you should start building those uh, stepping blocks. Um, so um, as I understand you now, uh, you um, you think that uh, to start with uh, help desk support is better than to um, start with a job like a network administrator. That could be like a next round, right? For someone who has no experience, a practical experience, you've got some very good formal education. Uh, but for somebody who's never managed a network before, most organizations aren't going to put you in charge of managing the network because there's way too many things that can go wrong. And I'm speaking to you as a formal network administrator that knew what he was doing and still was able to screw up everything. So uh, you usually would start at a help desk, even though you have some formal uh, you have a formal uh, education that deals with security. Usually you don't start in the security group. That's changing a little bit these days. There's more opportunities as security gets much larger. But most of the people I worked with that were part of their security teams are people that first were in their networking team because there's a huge foundation of networking and IT security. And then the people that were in networking are people that usually started with file servers or on the help desk, and they just moved up into those roles as time went on. You will know at the help desk what interests you the most, and you'll probably spend time focusing on those technologies, and it will just be a natural move for you to get into those roles wherever they happen to be. All right. That's good. Um, and um, do you think I need a A-plus certification for the meantime, or – I can only like uh, watch some videos of uh, you know help desk support just to refresh my memory with some stuff some, uh, to apply uh, in my resume. I would recommend you look at what the employers in your area are looking for. Some employers would like to hire somebody who is completely knowledgeable in the job they're putting them in. They're, they know everything there is to know about hardware. They know everything there is to know about operating systems. They want to put them in the help desk. And from day one, they want them to be completely efficient at what they're doing or as efficient as they can be. Uh, they are willing, because of that, to pay a little more. Uh, so there are some employers, however, that do not want to pay that amount, that are willing to hire anybody off the street who has just a little bit of an education, maybe doesn't have a formal uh, type of experience, they'll bring them in and they'll train them. You'll learn all of those things on the job. They'll get you the training that you need. They'll help you internally learn these things. Uh, they will may even have the manuals that you can read and they'll put you in that role. They obviously don't have to pay quite as much because of that, but it's a trade-off. You didn't have any formal um, uh, experience. So that's the trade-off is that you aren't able to get quite the dollars per hour that you would like to because of those challenges. But there's always a next step. Your goal is to suck as much as you can out of the knowledge around you and get it into your head and learn as many things as you can so that you can make the next step for a better job, for more money, for a different place. There are some people out there that will hire in their network teams for people out of college, or they'll hire in their security teams for people out of college. You will find those to be uh, 
less, uh, they're kind of rare. They're, they're unusual to find people doing that. Usually they're starting them in the help desk. Also, the more people you know, the better. And I've said this in other study groups, and I think it's very good uh, recommendation for people, especially people starting out, go to a Microsoft user group, go to a Cisco user group, go find the technology user groups in your geographical area, go to those meetings, meet those people face to face, uh, learn what they do, where they work, ask them the question, uh, do you how do you usually hire? Do you hire people right into your network teams? Do you hire people into your desktop teams? Do you hire people in your server teams? Do you have a help desk? What do you people? What do you usually look for for people in the help desk? Do you need a lot of experience? Um, and get to know the people. Uh, my first job I got, and I didn't know anybody there when I got hired. It was recruiting that was done on campus. But every job after that that I ever got in my career was because I knew somebody who worked there. And I don't mean know them like they were a close personal friend. They were a business associate. I stopped in there multiple times a week. Here's your printer cables today. Uh, do you need something plugged in? I'll plug it in. I was nice. I was dressed well. They knew my name. If I, they needed something, I could get it for them. They, I was their conduit back to the company where they purchased all their computers. If something went wrong, I could fix it for them, and I made sure that I did, and they got to know me. So when positions opened up there, and I said, well, I'm interested in that position, they go, oh, we don't even need to interview you. Let's just sit down and get your desk ready. Uh, that's what you're hoping for throughout your career is to find those pockets of people. I think uh, LinkedIn's a very, very good thing to use in that scenario. There may be people that you went to school with that now have a job, and now they're looking to fill even more positions in their company. These are great uh, connections to take advantage of to, to find those people because you're going to find people where you're working, and you're going to end up meeting them again at another company down the road. And you always want to work with people you know rather than a stranger who came off the street. All right. That's awesome. So um, this is all the questions that I uh, wanted to ask you. Um, I thank you so much, and I really appreciate that. Um, and uh, I might contact you uh, later on if I have any questions. Please do. Thank you so much. You're absolutely welcome. Thanks for calling. There's a, You can always, on my website, at the top or the bottom is a Contact Us link. That's really a Contact Me. Uh, goes directly to my email inbox. That's a great way to get in touch with me and ask specific questions. And I, I, I might give you a one-liner back because I get a lot of a lot of emails that way. But I like to at least try to connect back. Oh, don't have anything for you. Yes, go here. Here's a link that's really good. I try to help in whatever way that I can. To the 718 area code, are you there, caller? What's your name? Yes. Uh, hey, uh, this is Mohammed. How are you? Hey, Pleasure. Mohammed. Thanks for calling. What can we do for you? Uh, actually, my question is, I recently uh, got my degree, my bachelor's degree in information technology, and the specialization was in cybersecurity. Great. My question was, uh, uh, what are the obstacles of, like when you apply for a company, when you uh, they are looking for clear positions, like you have the degree, uh, you might have the experience, but they are looking for those candidates for clearances. So is, is, is there any... Like, should we keep, because every job, like, mostly you look like these companies are specifically interested for those candidates who have clearance, uh, especially in the cybersecurity field. It is. The security is a little bit weird, too, because it's so broad. One organization may be focused on a particular manufacturer's firewall, and another organization may also be focused on firewalls, but from a completely different manufacturer. And we're talking about some very complex technologies. If you just look at firewalls, the firewall from Palo Alto Networks is a very different animal than the firewall from Checkpoint. But they're, they're firewalls. They're exactly the same thing, aren't they? Oh, no. They are very different in internals and externals and features and capabilities. And somebody who's very proficient in Checkpoint may not necessarily be proficient at all with Palo Alto Networks. So you, you already have this, this divide in security of knowing a third-party manufacturer's products. And, of course, you've got routers, you've got uh, intrusion prevention, you've got firewall, you've got URL filtering. Some of these things are all contained within the same system. Some of these are separate systems. Some organizations are still using proxies uh, for their internal to external communication. Ouch. 
Uh, you've got the need to scan executables as they're coming into your email system. Some of the scanning is being done in the cloud. Some of it's being compared to larger databases where things have already been scanned and sent through. There are multiple uh, areas where security becomes incredibly important, but also is very detailed. No one person is can possibly know everything there is to know with IT security today. It is way too broad. There are way too many systems. Uh, in, in most cases, I was an expert in the firewall that I worked with for seven years. But even then, the people that would buy the firewall might use 25 to 50% of its capabilities. And they just didn't have the cycles. They didn't have the time to be able to learn every other little piece about that firewall. And we'd walk in and say, why aren't you using this as your IPS, as your uh, URL filter? Why aren't you doing IPsec uh, site to site on here? Why aren't you using this for your host-based VPN concentrator? And they just don't have the time. So one of the challenges that most people I think have, most organizations have, is they have to get the right combination of people. Okay, you're going to handle reporting and firewall. You're going to handle IPS and URL filtering. You're going to handle this other piece we have with IPsec and these other firewalls and things we have set up. So there's no single answer I can give you that says, here is the skill set you need to be able to walk in the door and say, I'm ready to go for security for everything you want. All you can really do is start gathering your own inventory of these, these pieces of knowledge. And that's why people will go get a Cisco security certification so that they can walk into an organization that has Cisco products and say, I'm Cisco security certified. And certifications, that's not meant to say, I know everything there is to know about this product. It's so the employer knows, okay, there's a baseline that I know you at least know this much about this technology, and we can build on the rest if, if you don't know any more than that. And so people will start building these inventories themselves of these technologies. You get a little bit of SANS. You get some Palo Alto Networks knowledge. Um, you start gathering information from VMware. You get a little Microsoft. You load in a little Linux. And now you've created this foundation that you can use when you walk in the door with an employer of all of these different things that you've done. And while you've been doing that, hopefully you've been able to get some practical experience and some stories and some adventures in security that you can talk about. I guarantee you this past weekend that every organization had people on site that were trying to mitigate or, or even eradicate this ransomware. This would have been an excellent opportunity if you worked one of these organizations to hang out with the file server people, to hang out with the desktop people, to hang out with the security team, because you know they were going into their uh, systems. They were disabling SMB version 1. They were setting up rules in their firewall. They were checking the systems that were in another part of their organization they couldn't access with their uh, their GPO. They were uh, making sure all the antivirus was up to date with the latest uh, signatures. They were making sure machines that weren't patched before were patched. Everybody was on deck. Those are opportunities you want to look for. And if there's somebody who needs a, a warm body that said, take this flash drive, go to this machine and install this patch, you're the person who can do that. You should take advantage of those opportunities, and they're happening all the time. It, you don't have to wait for a massive worldwide piece of ransomware to go running amok. There's projects going on every weekend in these organizations. Simply ask, do you need another hand? You got this one covered? Do you need anybody unboxing these 50 systems you have to set up? They will help you. Uh, they will they will want you there and plugging in those systems. Maybe that would be a good way to approach it as well. Thank you very much. Uh, my another question is, uh, Professor, uh, I'm a cryptologic language instructor now. Like I speak six, seven languages, and now I mean I make a decent amount of money and same, like salary, salary is very good. But my question is, like I'm I'm focusing on cybersecurity part. How helpful, like my cryptological language, being as an instructor, it can play a role with, uh, if I apply for a, a cybersecurity position. Are there any, like, if you know, like different languages, and then you apply for the cybersecurity while you have a bachelor degree on this field? Uh, will that 
count as a positive thing uh, in relate to the technology or no? It, it can be extremely valuable. Um, it, it, and you've probably seen this uh, as much as I have, because when I brought take in these uh, firewalls, there is all kinds of cryptography being used inside of that device for different things. So you've got IPsec running. IPsec has its own set of phase one, phase two. There's hashing and cryptography that you have to configure in both of those. You've got site to site for your IPsec. You've got host based connections that are using its own set of cryptography to be able to make those happen. And you have to configure how you want those to work. If you are using these firewalls, a lot of these firewalls perform SSL decryption, really TLS decryption. So you have to understand how to set up the firewall as effectively as an SSL proxy. But that also means that you're going to need to set up a trusted certificate on that firewall that's going to create dynamically a new certificate for every HTTPS site that a user visits from inside your organization. It's going to build that certificate in real time and present that to the user based on the information that's that exists in the actual certificate out there on the internet for that third party. So all that, 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 that process itself, I, I, go ahead. I, I do I do understand that, Professor, but sorry for cutting you. That, but mainly I should have told you, like, I'm a language instructor. Like, I know different languages, not like the language of the computer languages, but like some other languages. You, like, for example, you said, like, uh, Arabic, some other languages, some, some other languages from other regions. So will that be a part of a security when you apply for a cybersecurity field? Will that help you or no? But I do understand, like, a different languages, they cryptography and then sync texts and then hashing that they use. Well, this is where you now get to apply all those things. So you've got your cybersecurity piece. And that, that example I gave you of certificates and being able to do this is kind of a foundational, fee, foundational function mm -hmm. of security. But it's surprising how few people understand the nuances of implementing these certificates, getting the cryptography right, and then being able to use it. Now imagine having to do that across not just organizations in this country, but now you've, you're, this country is communicating with organizations around the world. You have a need not only in help desks for people that are like a firewall manufacturer, has people calling from organizations in, in China, in Japan, in the Middle East, in India, in the UK, in uh, Slavic countries, in being, people speaking Spanish, people from uh, uh, Portuguese, uh, in English, and they're all calling this one set of help desks. So there's immediately a need for these multinational countries to be able to talk security, to talk technology, depending on where these people happen to be in the world. So there's already a benefit there. Also, all these companies that have these firewalls and security devices, they're also writing all of the, the manuals and the content, but they're also having to write this these manuals and content in all of these different languages. And same thing for their help desk and their uh, their website. They have to keep their website updated for all of these other languages as well. Except the companies in the United States, how do you take a concept and a set of documents that was written in English and somehow put it in a form that makes sense for somebody in Italy or somebody in Germany or somebody in Japan because you can't just stick it into a translation program and out pop something perfect. There are nuances. There are uh, there's differences in how the language is spoken where you really do need somebody knowledgeable in how to do this. So you may be able to combine these things together. I've uh, on my website. There's a lot of people that were that are in healthcare that now want to go into uh, into information technology. And I said, what a great opportunity to go into information technology at a hospital. Who knows better the requirements mm. of healthcare than somebody who's worked in healthcare? Similar thing for you. There's an opportunity to take this knowledge you have mm -hmm. in uh, in the spoken language and being able to translate and do things for people that are using technology wherever they happen to be in the world. And people who are jumping around to different organizations all have some little bit of knowledge like that. If I, I've gone into banks, they have their own set mm -hmm. of things they do as a bank. I've gone into nuclear power plants. They have their own set of things they do as a nuclear power plant. Yes, the computers are the same. The network is the same. But there's some unique 
aspects to that that unless you've ever worked with an electric company, you're never going to understand the requirements the electric company has. Same thing for a bank. Banks have their own set of requirements. Healthcare has its own set of requirements. So you can take advantage of those things too, depending on where you're coming from. Okay. I'm, I'm like, my last question is, uh, now that I have uh, my degree, my bachelor in IT and specialization in cybersecurity, which position I should target the most and apply for those? This is one of your I'd challenges. Like is just opinion. you want to get in the door, and that's well, we sort of talked about this in some of the earlier calls. Getting in the door in most places is going to be their help desk, um, and getting in the door in most places is the help desk. It's a good place if you speak a lot of languages to be as well. Uh, this is also a good place as you're jumping off. If an organization has a networking position open and you really like networking, you know you want to go into networking, that might be the place you apply. But I find that a lot of places want to try you out on the help desk side first, and then they're going to roll you into something that's more specific to what you need. It also gives you an opportunity to meet the people internally and to understand what their requirements are, understand the type of people they're looking for, and be able to be hired internally when the right time comes along. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you for calling. Appreciate it. That's one of the challenges I think anybody has uh, in dealing with a worldwide base. I certainly do because everybody in the world's connecting to my website. How do I handle differences in language? It's a uh, it's differences in language. Just the technology itself is di is a different language, and then you have the language every everybody else speaks. Let's go to eight six three area code. Are you there, caller? What's your name? Yes, my name is Nestor. Um, I just have a quick question. I'm currently going to uh, college to get my, com my computer science degree, but um, I'm not taking classes in the summer, and then this opportunity came up, and I want to advice on it. Um, this company called SecureSec, they have a cybersecurity bootcamp specializing in getting you ready to work as a security analyst. So I was wondering, would you advise to someone to do that kind of stuff or just keep going to school, get your certification, do it that way, or should I invest into getting that book camp? And they, they, they encourage you to keep going to school, so it's not like that will be the end. I will still have to finish my degree, but they will prepare you for real-life work as a security analyst. It's, it is a little bit of a challenge. I generally, as a rule of thumb, tell people to avoid the concept of a boot camp for technology because technology doesn't work the same way uh, that a real boot camp would. It's not like we can run 20 miles a day and suddenly be better at this. Boot camps for technology generally focus on a, a certain group of content. They might tell you I've got an A plus boot camp or a network plus boot camp or a security plus, plus boot camp or a security analyst boot camp, whatever that is. Uh, and they, they take you through the core pieces of information you need to know. But as someone who has already put together content like this before for an entire course for a plus an entire course for network plus an entire course for security plus and more it takes a lot more than a week or even two weeks to be able to take everything you would need to know and put it into a form and present it to you in a training class that's handled from eight to five every day there's just not enough hours in the world in including you've now got to understand and get that information in your head so that you can then spit it back out again on an exam. Uh, that That's a challenging thing to try to do, regardless of how much you happen to know. If you were going to go to a boot camp, the things that I would ever possibly consider people needing to go to a boot camp is after you've done everything. You've read the books, you've watched the videos, you've gone through some Q&A, you've checked out uh, as much as you can on the exam objectives, you really have a very good understanding. You're practically ready to take the exam. That is the only time I could ever recommend somebody walk into a boot camp because they are relatively expensive. I don't think I've ever seen a boot camp for less than $2,000 for a week of time, and that's, which is a huge investment. And then you need to somehow cram all that in in a very short period of time. You're not going to be able to do it from ground zero. It helps if you walk in with 75% of it already in your brain, and it's going to be the last 25%, which I think is still a pretty high number. Really, you should walk in at 90% and hope that's the – but if you're if you're at that point already, why would you go to a boot camp? So it's almost a, almost exactly, a, yes. it's almost a challenge there. Yeah, so it's yeah. it's more up to the individual. Some people really like the idea of trying to cram it all in. 
uh, and make it happen in a week's time. I just don't find in most cases that they are they are as productive as you would need them to be for the amount of money you happen to be spending on them. Everybody's different, but that's that's kind of my rule of thumb. Yeah, yeah, it, it, it is really expensive. But thank you for the advice. That, that was my, my only question. Thanks, Nasser. Appreciate you calling. Yep, bye-bye. Well, that brings us to, gosh, well over the, the last hour here. We went, ran kind of long in the study group, but I appreciate it everybody who called in. Thanks for the chat room that was here today. Thanks for dealing with the live stream and not having our Socrative and not being able to answer questions. Although we got through a good number of questions. I thought we did pretty good for ourselves, didn't we? I think that's, uh, that's always the challenge is you never know on a live event how things are going to go. Well, we've got another study group ready for you. In two weeks will be our A-plus study group, Network Plus, and in a month from now, We'll do the Security Plus. You can always check to see when the next group is going to be at ProfessorMesser.com slash calendar. Thank you for joining us this month. We will see you next time on the Security Plus study group.